You must all have heard that uh, data is the new oil. Uh, who hasn't heard that expression yet? You haven't heard the expression, data is the new oil? That's good to know, because I think that it was like a, an old Chinese proverb that was being refactored by the industry. It is not so. When they said data is a new oil, they meant it's a new raw uh, substance that you can mine and, and, and pull from somewhere and then refine it and get value out of it. And of course, it's a very bad metaphor because we're trying to get our whole industry of the non-renewable sources and into renewable sources. So it's a, it's a bad metaphor in many, in many respects. But it's, a, it's especially a bad metaphor because it was also used, that is a new oil, because the price went down a lot over the last, if you look the crude oil of the last years. And so at the same time, to compute resources, to manage big data went down, the storage resources and the price of that went down, and all those things together make that big data became available and in reach of a small, small startup like mine, like many others in this room, we work for startups like five people. With five people you can build your mini Google. By using open source software, we use Elasticsearch, we'll come to it later. You just, you just take open source software, you apply the knowledge you have on data, you find a business case and you can build a company out of it. And this was, impossible, I would say, seven, eight years ago, because the compute power was so expensive that you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to, um, to actually um, uh, pull that off. Yeah. And, and so it is a combination of these new, of these new uh, technolo technological evolvements that made that, that big data became so fashionable and that so many people dived into it. But, one of the biggest challenges, I will come back many times, is the cleaning of the data. So it sounds like big data is easy, but even for you, maybe quick question for those that are working in data, how much percent of any data project goes into the cleaning structuring? You can, too much? 80%, I would dare to say 90. So when, when you go into a big data project, the end result can be very sexy. You have this visualization or this extreme nice correlation between elements that nobody figured out. But that was like the last 10, 20% of the project. Like 80, 90% goes still into structuring, figuring out what do we have. And that's, that's the, um, the unsexy part about big data. There's a lot of uh, hard work that goes into preparing any project. Yeah, and uh, it's a part you never see that very few people talk about. It's the part we will uh, tackle later on. Like you need to know how you're going to structure which type of big data. Um, but that's that's basically a large part of the project. That is the structuring of this rough resource, which is being referred to as the oil that you can then mine. Now, if you look at the big data, the easy formula about what is big data is if it doesn't fit Excel anymore. Yeah? It's a bit of a joke, but if you can't figure the, the table in Excel anymore, you have, you've got big data. It's not true, because big data is a lot, lot, lot bigger. So his suggestion is to restart your computer. Restart my computer. That's a very bold step to take, but I will, I will, I will, um, I will do that. Let's see if to my so restart. It's going to ask 10,000 questions for updates, but let's go for it. Bam, 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 as you can see. I'll let you wait for the <laughs> to start up. So cleaning, cleaning of data is a, is a big part of projects. Then uh, who has heard about the Vs of big data? Yeah, can you name a few? Velocity. Sorry? Velocity. velocity. So velocity is the speed at which the data change. So this is a, when you talk big, about big data, one of the most common um, uh, uh, concepts that are being attached to it is the, the three Vs, the four Vs, the five Vs, the 27 Vs. Yeah? So uh, somebody came up with like 27, I believe. But the, the main one, one of the main ones is the velocity. That means the speed at which your data change. So imagine, uh, I'm going to go to your example of the PhD. You've done interviews and you have uh, questionnaires and you get the data. It's a one-off exercise and it never changes afterwards. So looking at it from a big data perspective, it's quite boring because you have static data. You did it once, it's probably not very big because you had to do the interviews or ask people over the internet to fill it in and you have a few hundreds, thousands, ten thousands. But in big data respect, that's nothing. Yeah. So um, that wouldn't be a high velocity. But if you look at um, the exchange rates, or, uh, at, at we, or the stock exchange, do they change a few times per second, per millisecond even for certain of them. If something happens here now, then I will feel really stupid. Um, and so the, 
the, the, the, the pace at which data elements change, the, if you want to keep track of all the different timestamps at which a certain stock price was quoted, it's going to create a permanent stream of data. And this is already one of your challenges. Because afterwards, you, you need to store that somewhere. And if you want to keep that history, it's just going to take up an immense amount of space. And so when you set up a big data environment from the start, you have to figure out what am I going to do with it. If I'm an economist and I want to do daily analytics on stock exchange or stock markets, maybe the hourly average is good enough or the daily average or the weekly or the monthly, depending on which time frame I'm doing my research. And so when you set up your, when you set up your projects, it's extremely exp uh, important to know from what you're going to be doing and what type of data you'll be you'll be processing afterwards. So I get lots of pop-ups here, so I hope that the good one is quickly going to be among them. So let me open that presentation again. Let's see what this gives. A blue screen. Still nothing on there. as blue as it was before. Reboot it. Do you want to try this another Yeah, we could actually. It's a good idea. Thank you for proposing it. Um, I think that she just went, Gabriella went to get hers. So we'll do that, of course. But so, yeah, there, as you see, we, we didn't run into this one before. I'll, uh, I'll just get done. So we were, we were at the V's. And which one? So the volume that you have to manage is a, is a, is a big one too. Yeah, I, I was jokingly saying yeah, if it doesn't fit in Excel, but if you look at it historically, gigabytes and terabytes were considered big. Now, nowadays in big data, we talk zettabytes. Yeah, it's like you can't get your head around how much data that is, but it's really, really, really big. Um, you're gonna talk, yeah, go ahead. So I'll let you manage that one, yeah, that's fine. And so the, the volume of the data and really, if you look at volume, maybe some of you know about cloud computing. You have to think about how will you store the data, and in the cloud you can store really cheaply. And that prices really went like, that those prices really went down, down. Oh wow, you have no to-dos. I envy your to-do lists, really. But you're also working on nothing, so now we need to talk. <laughs> uh, so that's going to work, right? If we do the presentation modes, it should go on there. You already pushed it or not? Yeah, it should be. I think it's just the uh, yeah. So, yeah, we have screen. Fantastic. <laughs> so I'll quickly go on there. So we skip that. We In the introduction, we didn't miss the big data part. You get the slides afterwards also, so don't you don't have to take notes. Um, we're here now, so the speed at which things uh, change. Some data are static, some are real-time, changing all the time, so it's hard to keep track of the data sources. Uh, the variety. This is something very important to understand when we talk about data. There's a thing called structured data. And so, uh, typically, historically, big data was stored in databases. It got structured by an application. You filled in the form, first name, last name, and it would be stored in a database which had a field, first name, last name, and so that's structured data. And then you have a PDF file, which is an image. And it was stored as a blob in a database. It was you wouldn't even know what's in it. And so, or a video file, it's like one big uh, amount of data that you need to stream, watch analogically to know what's in there. And so that type of data is unstructured. And then you have multi-structured hybrid in-betweens or metadata being attached to sorts of that. And so it's very, very, very different. And then a last one that's often in use um, is, your, is the value. Like, is it business intelligent? Is it good for analysis, for reporting? I think that most people, when today they work on data, we're still in this phase. And the big data real value comes from complex advanced predictive business analytics and insights, things you didn't know. So, for example, in big data, you can throw an unstructured data set at a tool. And this is not the way to do it, but some people do it. You throw, and then you, look, you ask what is correlated. Yeah? And so then the, the algorithm will come back and say, I found these fields, they're highly correlated. So, um, but so, uh, let, let's take an example, and that's why we still need a lot of human, human experts. The system will find, ah, uh, ovary cancer happens a lot in women. Very few men get it, yeah, logically, yeah. But if you're not a doctor, or if you didn't study uh, biology or medicine, the, to the computer, it doesn't know that men and women 
have certain body parts and the cancer is related to it. And so when you do this medical research, you will get that. And this is a very stupid, low-hanging example. But of course, this goes for a lot of things. If you work at a, at, a, at a health tech and you're looking at huge data sets of research data, you don't know what's in them, you can ask like which fields are correlated. And sometimes you find stupid correlations, and sometimes you need to be a doctor to understand, wow, this is really valuable. There's no research that has ever proven that these are like typically uh, all the men between that age coming from that origin which has this previous condition seem to develop that condition at that age. Yeah? That's, that is based on historic, you do predictive analytics. Yeah? And so that's where a lot of the value of big data comes from. You gain insights you couldn't gain with old school type of structured data and you, you mesh everything together and you look at it in new different ways. So that's typically where you unlock a lot of value. Now, what is it used for? Lots of you in retail, they will be here for better understanding of customers and then of course by better understanding them, selling more. And that, that's like where many big data projects have started was, in, was customer uh, CRM systems, mining the data, doing uh, what is called uh, digital marketing and data driven marketing where you get an email and you don't really notice but there's a tracking ID in there and I think you were in that business, right? You click on that email and now he knows, aha! you have clicked at this point in time using that browser on that IP address you, like an insane amount of data that you're not aware of by just clicking it. And even without doing anything more, by knowing that you clicked from this email, your identity is known, because probably it was enriched from a database, and by clicking it from your laptop, you're enriching that click with your full fingerprint of your laptop or mobile. Already knowing that you opened it on which type of laptop, which type of mobile, it's extremely valuable. And so these things that look very mundane and simple that each of us does every day, if you look and learn the, the big data, approaches behind it, you can use them for the good and the bad. Yeah? For example, something that most of you don't like is price discrimination. Ever happened to you? Price discrimination? Yes? What does the lawyer say about that? It's illegal. It's illegal. Well, it's happening every single time you buy something online. If you go on Airbnb, if you buy an airplane ticket, if you go to Bull.com, Amazon, and so on, they will look like, oh, wow, this person has a very fancy 3,000 euro Macintosh is coming to my website from a bank or a big multinational. This person wants to travel to Paris next weekend. Whoa, I'm gonna only show with a certain margin high-end stuff. Oh, this person is coming on a cheap mobile phone per month mobile thing on an old laptop with Linux running. You have different pricing. This has been tested and established, proven that like almost all e-commerce websites discriminate against the profile as soon as you log on based on location and the enriched profile. Can you confirm this? You have heard about it, you can confirm it? I don't think you can confirm it. It's not that that happens yet for many e-commerce websites, just the basics and the price discrimination doesn't happen very often. But the offer discrimination, yes, putting some offer in front of people versus others, yeah, it happens often. So it's good that you think it's that way. I know big data miners at e-commerce sites, I can tell you there is hardly anybody paying the same thing. If you go to Amazon, it's insane. Uh, if you go to AliExpress, it's insane. Yeah. So those sites is almost individual. That yeah? are example outside of the ordinary website. I would say they are the big ones. But yeah. The biggest website in Belgium, maybe a few of them are doing it, but. It's, it's too complex for because you need a lot of data to do it. Exactly. Yeah. Because and that's the other thing about big data. You if you build such complex profiles. In order to improve and optimize, you need a lot of data to make it work. You need a model that you have proven to work and then you roll it out and replicate it. Yeah? And so you gain insights uh, and some of them are really straightforward and others are very unexpected. For example, part of big data, you can serve a different website. So you can say, classic example, if men come to my website, I give them a blue version. If women come, I give them a pink version. Very stereotypical, don't uh, <laughs> put it on me for, for those choices. And then you find out, oh, we didn't sell anything extra. So let's give everybody a blue website. Same result. Oh no, blue is worse. Okay, what's the origin? Which other color? And so websites are testing all the elements. If I put the button on the left or the right, if I put a picture of a man or a woman, if I put a picture of somebody looking at the, the logo or the price app or not, and all those things have tiny, tiny uh, click-through rates improvements and all of them together make a real difference. The fact that the person is looking to the order button or not is maybe 
0.03%, but combined with good usability and having that right picture for the right person, works. And so one of the things we, we were talking about, uh, optimization in process. So uh, let's go for retail. An example, I know that's real. You order, for those who are parents, you order children's clothing on a website. One year later, they will send you the offers of the same sex that you ordered for the first time, and the, the, child, the children in the pictures will have been aged by one year. Yeah? So they use the order, they know that this, is, uh, this process is just annual, it goes up. So the marketing isn't stick to man or woman or child of six years old. No, one year later, you get your voucher for the seven year olds. Yeah? Or if you know these big uh, things happening, communion or whatever uh, uh, event, live event that people tend to uh, dress up for, you will get a special voucher if they think that you are of that religion. But if you have, uh, if you're called Mohammed, the likelihood of you getting the voucher for the communion is much lower, yeah? because that came out of the correlation. Boys named Mohammed do less communions, so we're not going to offer them this voucher. And so just be aware that this big data, for good, for bad, correlations, very sensitive culturally, things you, you, you can do there. Many things that are being done that are actually fully illegal, because it's discrimination, but it's sold through optimization. Yeah? We're not going to bother this person with a useless voucher, so it's in the interest of the user experience, so we can do it. If you would look at the, at the law side of it, you cannot discriminate based on religion. Yeah? And so you get this... This, this gray zone of things where you go. You cannot discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, of sex or whatever. And so a lot of, this, a lot of optimization is done exactly on those elements. Yeah? So one, one thing there. And again, do interrupt me. Now, crude oils versus refined oil. One of the ways to go from the one to the other, we often think that this big data and AI, the way we get there is fully automated, but that's not true. And for the ones in the room that do data analytics, there's a lot of human work that goes into validating the first results and getting a training data set. And the quality of the training data sets fully determines the end result. And so there's many tasks, and this is one example, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, you heard about it? Some of you did? No. If you ever have, how will I say this diplomatically, um, uh, a low, a low hanging task that is administrative or looks administrative. Like all of you, when you go to a website and you have to determine for Google that you're human, yeah? is this a street sign or a, a, a storefront? You're basically tr unpaid training an algorithm. Yeah? You can get those jobs done there. So if you upload your profile picture on a website, you can bet on it that somebody has checked whether this is a, a porn pic or a profile pic. Yeah? Because it's going to be shown in a different platform. And so they use services like these to validate. And the task is, if you get, so these people have a different interface, they just get a task, one task, and then it has one unit. And the, the goal is determine this is a face. I say this is, and so they, they get a stream of faces, and then they get a car. They have to say another face, yeah. And and so this will this task will pay maybe one cent because it's anybody can do it. You don't need to be trained for it. But then there's higher tasks like a legal text determine uh, what it is about, yeah. Or uh, shopping videos, shoplifting. You have to watch a situation. Do you think this was a shoplifter? Yes or no? And so these tasks are going all the way up now to learn robots, to learn surveillance, to learn... Th so there's a lot of semi-automated big data analytics being done to get good training. And so one of the ways to get there is to use human intelligence, make it scalable and cost efficient. Uh, and you can just open an account and get humans do that sort of stuff. So imagine where this is often used for. You want to have a prospection list in a certain niche and there's no directory websites, so you have to visit websites and you have a list of websites. You can go and scrape them and get it from them, but you throw it in Amazon Turk, a list of 100 websites, and say, I want to have the telephone number and the name of the person to call in that department. And somebody will go for 10 cents and look at all those websites, fill in a form. And if you want to raise the quality, you say, I want to have a second person do the same. And if they come up with the same data, then I'm going to take the result. If they come up with different data, I'm going to have a third party qualify which of the other two were correct and the person sending in the bad data will not get paid. 
but you will pay more for the third person doing the verification work. Yeah? And so there's a, this insane model of cheap labor. This is not in the Western world. This is typically happening in the developing world where people in a cyber cafe in room are doing these tasks. Yeah? This is creating literally 10,000 of uh, real-time jobs that you can just send a big data set, you put it in the flow and they get it in screens and it's a task. Yeah, just to get you acquainted. One of the ways to get from crew to, is to train and to filter that way. That's not the automated way, it's a semi-automated way. Now, I, I see three types of data. Structured data, sitting in a repository, a database. So it's, it's very clear what it is. It was, it's, it's the things that are being analyzed and overanalyzed uh, that, that are being used in any of your businesses, in any of your academic environments that you're working today. That's what the structured data is, what rules it all. Then there is the unstructured data. So it has, doesn't have a predefined data model. It's not organized in a predetermined way, but you do keep it. Yeah? So in big data, and this is something, when you develop a system, you do privacy by design. That means you're going to look up front, what do I need, for what purpose, can I do that, and should I keep it and not? And in big data, historically, it was the other way around. Whatever we can store, we should store it, we'll figure out later what we do with it. Yeah? Which is definitely not privacy by design. So if you have privacy data in those data sets, be very aware that you should not use that approach. But if you are, for example, collecting medical data from devices and you're looking for a breakthrough invention and you don't know what you're looking for, you might want to keep it all to process later and find correlations that you couldn't have imagined before. Yeah? And so there's, there's many applications where they now find value of things that were tracked unintentionally. Yeah? But again, the privacy part of it is very important to consider. If you track, make sure that you're not, uh, without consent, tracking something for a purpose that was never meant to be tracked. And then there's semi-structured, it's in between. There's no formal structure, but you can extract it. Uh, there's semantic elements that you can use. You can uplift them to metadata, and there's a hierarchy or not within the data. So those are the three big different type of data, structured, unstructured, and semi-structured. Now, if you look at sources of data and of big data, typically, you'll have uh, media data, so uh, images, video, audio, social media, stream. This is like... It's really a lot. Eh? If you want to, it, it's called a uh, fire hose at Twitter. You have to pay API providers. If you want to have all tweets that are being tweeted permanently, there is, there, you can get what they call a fire hose, and you can get all the tweets. You just pay an, a big amount of money. And then you need to store it all. Just getting them all in means you need the infrastructure to receive that huge pipe of permanent tweets going out. Same thing with Facebook, same thing with LinkedIn. Like all of them had or have APIs with more or less data in it. Yeah, and so media, you'll get all the videos of, of Instagram. You can scrape them or you can pay to get them from the source. And the scraping is being made harder and harder because these platforms are silos. They want to own and monetize their data. As soon as you upload your video to one platform, another platform can download it from there without your consent. So it's always a bit of a gray zone again. You upload it, you're, the, you're, the, you're the, the holder of the IP, but by uploading into a third party platform, you are giving away many of that, that IP either with consent or in the terms and conditions. And that copy will live on that platform and it's very hard to get it off. And that's why they say as soon as you do something on the internet, it's on there forever. Because it's very hard to get something out of that. And big data makes it worse. Because you're not just uploading to one silo, it's probably being copied and scraped in many others. And so you might say, I'm going to take it off there. But the copy keeps to exist. Yeah? And, and so these things will never go away, which is a, which is a, a very big uh, legal worry. You might have seen, we have the very unfortunate, there has been a murder this weekend in Antwerp. The, the supposed perpetrator has been caught. He had a Facebook profile. These have been copied by 10,000 of people with screenshots that are all on their local computers, on their mobiles, that are being copied in an unsecured way. And this is the privacy of somebody who's going to go to jail yeah, for a horrible uh, murder. But this is, this is a very clear case where you see that this is being copied with, with definitely without consent. Yeah? And so the privacy law will fight with criminal law and our feeling of justice. Like, can we do this? And, and, and so um, I have zero sympathy for that person, but it shows the complexity of uploading something to a platform. Yeah? It makes you, you, you can't get it off, all the copies, even if Facebook has now taken down the page, those people have all the pictures. And this, this man, had a child who is definitely not guilty of the murder uh, that he, this father perpetrated. This child is now on all those pictures of all those people's computers and laptops and will be copied. And if you apply an aging algorithm to that face, 
in 20 years, somebody could say, hey, wasn't, was that your dad who, who killed that young woman uh, next to the water and dumped her? Why? Ah, my parents had this picture, I found it on a disc. And by then it will just be a feature on a computer, age the image. And you get the picture of what somebody would look like 10, 20 years on that. That's what the predictive analytics allows you to do. Yeah? There's models, you fit them. There was this, this, this joke about, post your picture, what was it, 10 or 20 years ago? You heard it or saw that online, it was, oh yeah, I'm posting a picture from 10, 20 years ago. Many people said, hey, watch, you're training an algorithm somewhere to age you by 20 years, because you have the end result today and you had the picture from 10 years ago. So people will age the same way in the future. So by taking this huge data set of all different types of faces, you know what they look 10, 20 years down the line. So it's extremely valuable. So it's people annotating a picture in a very innocent way on a social media network. But by the way that is being used in a big data approach, those people did not consent to feeding an aging algorithm on pictures. They weren't aware of that. It can be perfectly used for that. And so, by coming to this course, I hope that you will also go, <laughs> go in like, oh wow, I'm starting to look at these innocent things that I do online in like a, as a, uh, a little bit paranoia or as a hacker, or how could this be misused, yeah? And uh, often if you're an entrepreneur, you're looking at ways to use data in an original way, uh, but you have to stay within the law, and it's also good for everything you do to know, wow, this could be really reused, misused in that or that perspective. So media, clouds, uh, uh, public, private, third-party cloud platforms. Without knowing it, there's an insane amount of data that each of you owns that is in the clouds. Because at some point in your phone, you put a, a little consent that the copies of your pictures are going to Google or Apple to their motherships in the cloud and they're being stored forever. And so last week it leaked that for every single photo on Google Photos, there's a unique URL that you can access. It's a very long one, it's a very complex one, but if you brute force the URL of Google Photos, you could find every single picture, including all the private pictures that you haven't shared with anybody that you just you know, one day, nice to have the collection online in the cloud. If my phone gets stolen, I have to have all my pictures. Well, it doesn't seem to be as private as you thought it might have been. And so many of the things always think about what would happen if the general public would have access to this data. Yeah, it's probably not the goal that your private pictures are all accessible online. There's a web, uh, publicly available data. You go to a website, it doesn't mean that it's public that you can reuse it for free. Yeah? So there's a very big difference about accessing and seeing something. We, we forget this. Uh, I have children, uh, uh, 14, 19, they think, yeah, it's on the web, I can take a picture and reuse it. You know, it's on there for free, so everybody can reuse it. There's copyright law that does not mean the same thing, that you can reuse anything you see online for any purpose. But uh, I see that there is definitely a whole generation that has grown up with the idea, hey, it's on a website, I can reuse it. That can turn into a meme without thinking about, oh, wow, there might be being copyright related to that in the past. Uh, machine data, uh, so uh, data generated from the in interconnection of IoT, so IoT is uh, Internet of Things devices. If anybody working here for an IoT company, which one? Commuting. So give one uh, help, very short, I know what commuting does. You raised two and a half million recently, right? Uh, the company did? Three million. Three million, you see, wow, that's good. That's a lot of money you're gonna throw at Internet of Things. Sh tell us what the company does. Um, we do some uh, IoT that, uh, sensor that uh, check if there is a car or not uh, on the city under uh, parking places. Yeah. So, for example, on the size of this building, if you ever come here and in the evening, you, you will find it looks like a black uh, cover. It's a pot in the ground with a battery and a, and a transmitter, and it just senses is there a car above me or not. This means that they get this data in a central platform of all the cars around this building which means that people um, paying for parking, I, wanna, I have a parking spot next to the building, although I come by bike, but <laughs> that's a disclaimer. I have a parking spot here. He, his company, with his access, he can see one spot 72 is being used. Do I come late in the evening to work? What time in the morning do I arrive if I would come by car indeed every day? Who's parking from Uber? The headquarter of Uber Belgium is right across the corner, so all their drivers park in our parking spots all day long. He can detect a pattern. When did you arrive? When did you leave? Ah, they start coming in at 10 in the morning. They have training days. All the parkings are taken for the Uber drivers. Yeah? So he could see that from his platform, and that's just a breadcrumb of data but for something that's extremely useful, of course they don't sell it that way, they sell it, we're going to manage parking space more efficiently in cities. 
And there's even cities in Kortrijk, I don't know if you're the platform behind it, but where they have determined that all cars can park for free for 15 minutes. The only way to do that is by having a sensor to know which car has been parked for 15 minutes. Because they don't put a ticket, they don't do an arrival, and it's just the cars. So you just take an optical sensor or a metal sensor and you feel, ah, is there a car on Bob? And then 15 minutes start. If after 15 minutes a parking ward comes by on a parking spot and it's still taken, you can say, ah, no ticket, it's been here 15 minutes. And it's a, it's a proof for the city to say you were parked on a free without paying. So here's a 25 euro. Uh, uh, default uh, price. So, Internet of Things, it, it looks very innocent. He's not looking at license plates, he's not looking at how big the car is, but just the data of knowing the location and when there's a car above it can be very valuable. Is there other uses you can uh, tell us about that are, are good for society or that you typically pitch when you sell the solution IoT-wise? Um, for uh, for that, that sensor, we have a nice uh, a use case in Brussels, yeah. where we uh, uh, people with disability, yeah. uh, they can see if a place is uh, free. Okay, wow, well, fantastic. So, you know the location of the blue disability parkings. They're often taken by people who do not have disabilities. So that's the first use case. You can start policing. Well, there's a car there. Are they allowed to park on that parking spot? But secondly, if you are disabled and you need to have a bigger space to get out in a wheelchair, you can now see which ones are available. Secondly, it would reduce the time that we all drive around looking for parking, so reducing CO2 emissions and so on. So those are, of course, as the low-hanging fruits. But again, one IoT device, devices that they put in the ground, are generating permanent data. Is there a car on top of me or not? Once every, I don't know, second, minute. I don't know what the interval rates typically are because you're using a mesh network, I think. Uh, so LoRaN or Sigfox. So when there is a car parking, yeah? uh, we receive information. Okay, so you do pre-processing in the local uh, units. So this is something, uh, we're gonna touch upon it later, but it's a good way to start with it. So imagine the two ways to do what he's doing. He could do every millisecond or every second signaling to the, to, the, to the portal that they're running in the cloud using a lot of communication for useless transport of data, which is just like still a car above of me, still a car above of me, still a car above of me, still a car, and a oh, car has left, car has left, free spot, free spot, free spot, free spot. Or he could say, hey, wait, I'm going to put some processing power in my pot, which is in the ground, and it will detect, it will send, now I'm taking daytime stamp, now I'm free daytime stamp. If the car is parked for six hours, there's only one packet going out, still taken, and, pro and centrally. So I guess you do more of that? You do pre-processing? Uh, the, the less we uh, send message, yeah. the better it is. So this is, this is the design of the system. They've thought about it. They know what they want to do. They want to know when a parking spot is free. So they designed the whole system, the architecture, to take away a lot of communication, to take away the storage of a lot of useless data, and they put intelligence in the IoT device. There's more and more of that happening. So who among you has an, uh, an uh, Alexa, a home uh, a voice? Anybody has one of those voice uh, activated? servers at your service so you know the one i'm talking about voice assistants so actually all of your phones have one so supposedly there's they listen all the time but they only activate when they have the alexa word or the google or when they're being addressed and only from that part on they should send to the cloud it turns out that they can just determine give us the full feed because we're going to improve so for the sake of improving the user experience we determined, and this is really the real explanation they gave, it's very hard when you do voice assistant with accents. Yeah? I'm, I'm, uh, English is my third language, so I, I have some, some sort of accent of a non-native English speaker. So if I speak to it, it's going to be different than your accent, and your accent, and your accent. And although we all try to speak English, yeah? <coughs> but it's the worst. And so they say, yeah, we have to listen to it, and then we train. And so they have profiles. They can actually retro-determine your English level and the origin. So they can know, they can, in, in the US, they can put one in front of you of a Native American and they can tell where you come from. Because from the, the language, the way you speak, it gets very regional. Whether you're from Detroit or New York or Texas, it's a different, and like in, in Belgium, it's the same. We have accents across cities. So the algorithms now are being fine tuned on your accent. But to do that, they need to listen into you because you're the training set. They're not going to pay people to speak into it. I mean, they're doing it all the time. So you sell a cheap device 
people who are using it, they think it only gets activated on activating the Alexa, I want this or that, please answer me. The reality is it's uploading, I call it, it's an IoT device, a voice transactional, it's uploading the full audio feed. Yeah? Another accident you might have heard about, you can ask it to mail a conversation. So, Alexa, please mail this note to myself. So, not forget, tomorrow we should check why the setup didn't work on my laptop. End of note. Yeah? Somebody started getting those, started to get a, a couple's conversations because they had misconfigured his email address. And so whenever they were in the kitchen, he got a snippet of their conversations yeah, being mailed to his mailbox with a WAV file to it. So all those things is big data because you can imagine the size of those audio files and now it's video files. Yeah? Alexa now has a doorbell they're selling. So it's like a add-on doorbell with Wi-Fi on it. You put it on your front door. It does automatic recognition who's in front of your door and when there is a delivery, it already recognizes, ah, it's DHL coming up to the door, ringing, how ah, do you want, and then they have a lock that goes with it. It can actually unlock your door when you're not there, when the delivery is detected there. So they make integrations with DHL that the driver has a sensor, and when the driver is at your door and the video sees you and the, the, the Bluetooth connects, you can say, yes, this is a, I was expecting this package because they have your order, put it in my front. Door, your door opens. Yeah? All that, IoT devices. But imagine the size of data that all this is sending. This is just a stupid doorbell being sold for, I don't know, $100, $200. It comes with one year free uploads. You don't know where all the data goes. Supposedly it's stored for a week, you can maybe more for a month. But afterwards, is it being erased? Is it being mined, analyzed? What else do they do with it? We don't know. Yeah? So. So I, I touched upon this one earlier. Storage cost went down dramatically. Yeah? For all of you who've been in this industry for a long while, if you look how much you paid for your first phone, laptop, for your first memory disk, your USB disk, your SD card, and, what, and if today you just go to a media market, you see, or you go online, you see, I mean, those costs have gone down, and they'll keep going down. So the cost of storing those live video streams went, went, went dramatically down. When you go to storage costs, there still is a, um, a, 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 a difference between is it stored on a disk or on, on, on flash and on an SSD, and is it stored in something you can access really fast, real time. So for example, on Amazon, there is a glacier, so it's, the, it's like storage. So imagine you have your sales numbers from 2003, you say, I don't really need them, so I'm going to store them in Glacier. And next year, my data scientist is going to look at them again to see which customers from 2003 we lost. So then I'm going to pull them back out of Glacier. It will take a few hours to recover the data. Basically, they are on slow disks of uh, old materials in a, in a badly connected data center. Now you have your production data. You want them to have high availability in memory to go really, really quick. There, that's more expensive. And so there's a price depending on where you store, how fast you get access to it. Is it in memory? Is it on disk? Which type of disk? On which type of network? Is it undoubled? Is it, and so on. Is there high availability? Is there backups related to it? So that, but for all those types of storage, the cost has gone down and it became horrendously cheap when you talk about big amounts of data. Yeah, so. Um, Computer power costs went down, you know uh, the, the rules uh, about that. Uh, I don't know the exact cycle, but like every year or two years it should have, or the performance doubles for the same cost. So um, open source tools for big data, we'll, we'll, we'll come to those later. But really, if you want to start a project with big data, look at the open source stack. Actually, the big companies, they've all ditched the proprietary software suites. They all embraced and they contribute to the open data suites. Yeah? So you can build your, uh, really your own big data service just by gluing together those stacks and contributing back to the, to the source code that's open and free. Now, if you want to move up the, the data value chain, and they're in a great order here, run your own Google. So you want to move up the value chain. You don't just want to own the data. So the, 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 the platform we just heard about, they're not selling a pot that you put in the ground that tells you car on or off. They're probably selling a platform for a city to manage for handicapped or disabled people to find a parking spot. So they make a service on top of it. So it's not just a fact of having the data of available parking, it's a fact of having the service on top of it. And that makes it valuable. And they could sell that data stream to users, they can sell it aggregated to cities, but they could also sell it to ways 
to uh, any GPS uh, system in the car built in so that if somebody disabled in a Tesla needs to find uh, a parking spot uh, with a disability um, parking link to it, the car will find it, might even self-drive to it in the very near future. Yeah? And so those data feeds become more and more valuable because they found different ways to monetize this very basic on top of the, the connector, is there a car or not? Yeah? And in the future, it might get a lot further. See, I could imagine those things having a Bluetooth connector in it. And so we all have a phone and we all emit Bluetooth with the phone if we want to, if it's on. So the connector could now know which car is in there. But the next generation, your cars have a Bluetooth connector. So if you ping with that pot to your Bluetooth, you now know which car, or you can recognize the same cars coming back. You can then enrich it. If there's a camera system somewhere with license plates, you would only need one camera at the entry to then know, you know when the car came in, you know when it typically, how long it takes to park, you could find that license plate must now be in spot 72 because it's the only car that came in in the last hour. Or if two cars came in, you just take the next time the two come in and you'll know it too, or a different car by combination. So there's a lot of things you can do from a platform that you go like, how is it possible? I never consented to them knowing that my car was placed in point, in point 72, but based on one camera that is somewhere on the side and me passing by, I can connect the two together. And so that's when we talk about structured data, we're talking about a video feed, which is detecting a license plate. So that's called uh, an NPR, so it's license plate and, and, and um, number plate recognition, NPR. It's a very classic thing. There's an open source library to do that with. On very cheap hardware devices of $100, you can run the whole thing. It's op called OpenCV. You put a video feed into it, it will recognize all the license plate and output the license plate number to you. Yeah. I need a good camera. Sorry? The camera is expensive. So expensive, let's determine that. 50 euro, 100 euro? Okay. So that, that's expensive, yeah? But so think about owning a parking spot, 200 euro in Brussels, that's like, okay, that's a month, month and a half of parking costs, and you would have equipped your whole parking with an with a optical recognition system. Yeah? And if there's security cameras around, you can just enhance them with that feature, because you already have the good cameras hanging out there, if they're in the right resolution, of course. So, mind deeper, uh, look for those insights and especially look how to connect them. Uh, one thing in my, my, my company, that.be, the only thing we did is we took four government websites and we mashed the data together in one page in a, in a nicer visual way than the government websites and we attract 10,000 visitors per day. Zero marketing cost. 10,000 people looking for company information, that's very valuable for me as an entrepreneur because I can try to convert them. Tell those people, hey, I can show you a little bit of information for the first time and now get a free trial. Register your email address and from there I can do marketing automation, a drip campaign as it's called, to follow up emails, try to convince you to become a paying software as a service customer. So lots of the models that are out there are trying to mash things up, make them easier to use, Get, help you gain insights in an easy and uh, time uh, winning manner so that and visualizing is a big one of it. If you, if you have big data ideas, really look into the visualization. We have a course on that later on, like all the different ways to visualize big data because that really helps for us as humans to understand what's in there. Uh, don't underestimate the amount of open data sets that is underused. So over the last I would say five, seven years, the governments all around the world have really tried very hard to open sets. And so to give an example, um, Open Knowledge, where I'm the chairman, we started out because a student built a website that scraped, scraped the train tables. Huh? You're like, yeah, why would you even do that? Well, back in those days, the train tables were only owned by SNCB and MBS, so the national train operator. And this student found the website really shitty and made a better website out of it. Easy on a mobile phone. So you could see one is a train leaving. He scraped that. He got a cease and desist letter from the train. He was saying like, you violated our copyright. We own the copyright on the train table. Now, I don't know, how do you react to that? To who do the train table data belong? Legal opinion? We won't, we won't sue you for it. <laughs> I'm going to try to find it because you have to copyright. Just, just an Irish schedule. 
Yeah. So they try to proclaim the copyright, yeah? and they actually use, that's often done when you have uh, data, structured data, they use the database protection. So they said, we went through the effort of structuring the timetable. Yeah, we acknowledge the timetables are everybody's because it's paid with public money, and there's no corporate secrets in there, and it's a byproduct of what we do. But they said it's in our database, and we put in the investment of the database, and you're, you're infringing our database rights. And so we challenged that. So we made a nonprofit and we, we won. So it started with them attacking us. And now, if you go to the website of NMBS, it's a great victory since last year, they propagate open data. Because they understood that there's a lot more value for them in there that when you go to your routing application of church, which in many cases is one of the, the monoliths like uh, Google, Apple, Waze, whatever, that you add the transport. So if you go, who of you has traveled and used public transport with Google, for example? So we have more than half of the room putting on their hands here. Because it's so convenient. The reason it's so convenient is that Google has integrated the open data of those transport companies as feeds into their local map information. And so when you do routing, they can give you the option by car, by Uber, lead model for Uber, by public transport, selling more tickets for the public transport company. So there's a very, there was a very clear commercial uh, goal for them to open the data. But in the beginning, they were really like, we have a monopoly on public transport, you should not copy our data. And so it took five years for them to evolve from, this is our data you can't copy, to wow, actually we win a lot from connecting it. And this week, so after more than five years, they have teamed up with MEVB, Delane, and and, Stack, and they made their own intermodel. So you can now have between the public authorities. So five years down the line, it was private, us don't touch it, to like, please everybody integrate it, because we'll sell more tickets, and it's for the greater good that public transport is more used, especially when we do want to do an intermodal shift. So, but that's just one example, that transport is low-hanging fruit now, and it's sort of given. But there's many more companies and governments that could open data for the greater good that we could all use. If you think about uh, electricity grids, and nobody was working at Elia here, last time we had somebody from Elia, it's one of their biggest challenges. Because now that we have electric cars, and that we, it's very expensive, like if there's little wind and little sun, we have to fire up uh, coal and gas and, 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 uh, and uh, woods, uh, central, uh, I don't know, power plants, that, that still exhaust a lot of uh, bad uh, substances. And, and so if you could limit that, that would be very valuable. So if all those cars with electric batteries that have been loaded on a high peak wind energy, renewable energy, could feed a little bit back, that's called the smart grid, you could save a few power plants of firing them up when you need them. Yeah? And so if you would know which of the cars would drive tomorrow, you could completely deplete them knowing that there's sun in the morning and you can use the night energy to charge it for the day that the electric car is not being used. Yeah? But for that you need to connect it to my agenda to know am I coming to work by car or by bike. Yeah? And so we're interconnecting, combining, correlating, improving a lot of data sets that historically my agenda was not linked to my car use, was not linked to my energy bill. In the future, we could have revenue models for the energy company telling, Tom, if you share your agenda and you plug your car and you allow a two-way for us to get in or out your car, we're going to pay you. Because we do not have to fire up an extra uh, expensive or, or, or uh, non-renewable energy uh, power plant. Yeah? And that's exactly when, when we think about big data, I really hope I can inspire you to think about those things out of the box, connecting things that historically were not connected and where you can find people with consent to give their approval to do those things with it. And the technology is there. I mean, uh, community things is one example, but so they, they figured something out, the technology was there, they just did it, pulled it up, and now you see the, the great opportunities and the longer term you can use it for many more things, of course. You can count cars coming by, you can count bikes coming by, you can, you can do all sorts of um, getting the city into a smart city. Yeah? Um, another one, ask users for, or patients for input. We, we, we still live in a, in, a, in a society where this is uh, very formal. You, you get in somewhere and you have to give answers, but there's lots of information that people are willing to give you. It's in your benefit. There's, a, for example, um, a website that's called Patients Like Me. I don't know if you heard, anybody heard about that one. If you have a rare medical disease, 
you can go, I, I do, not, do not go there if you have <coughs> coughing, that's not no use. But imagine that you've been to 10 doctors and nobody can explain why you're having this condition and how to treat it. And you might say, okay, I'm going to give up a large part of my privacy, but I'm going to give my full medical history, I'm going to describe it, I'm going to put the imaging in there, what other doctors said. And then you find this one patient in Mexico that says, I had exactly what you had, and this was my solution. And if that works for you, you can say, wow, it also worked for me. And from then, you can get a new pattern. So this is a way of asking people for input. In that case, the, the pain is very high. Somebody has been struggling with their health, did not get addressed properly, and they sort of grouped around a platform like patients like me, where you find uh, people in the same situation that, are, that found or are looking for a, a cure. But there's, there's many other ways to, to do that. Huh? We already gave the example, Google asking you to say, before you can go on, we want you to answer if this is a storefront or a, a, a traffic sign. You're training the user to do that. Yeah? And there's many more ways where you can ask input from users to move quality of your data up, to qualify. Like, uh, you log in and is this still accurate? Or uh, would you prefer next time to do this? That? Or you might have had an external source saying, oh, I see two addresses for this person. Like, uh, an example doing that now, I think Bpos for deliveries, if they've seen that you got delivered, they have your name and your address, but you want this pickup point, Next time they will, they first of all allow you to log in and determine one for all future deliveries. fake data, which, what are you going to base yourself on and how biased is your data? Yeah, so the veracity, how much can you trust this data element that you extracted, structured or unstructured to be real? And so in many big data projects, you're going to have a is a complex one. It's so when we talk about cleaning data, I can give you a very practical example. If you found a company, the authentic source of your company address is what you put in a Belgistaasblad, the Moniteur Belge. That's where the, the government wants you to put it. And so if the notary made a mistake and put a wrong address there or a spelling mistake, like this, uh, this the road where we're here is called Witte Paters, There's a whole discussion which of those two documents, is, or two addresses, is the valid one. And then the second one is how come so something in the Bank Carrefour has changed this address? Under which authority were they allowed to do that? We can all say, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I mean, it was a wrong address, clearly. It was a technicality. He or she corrected it. But from a legal perspective, there's no framework explaining why they can do that or not. And so there's plenty of examples like that around it. Um, I don't know. Uh, address is a great one when we talk about veracity. What is the correct address? Already there is a two, two languages for this street. So a street is actually just a metadata for an XY coordinate. A string of XY coordinates which determines a street. And you, we put a name on that. And they can change. We don't think about it. I mean, who among you think your street and house number, if you own a house, belongs to you? 
I see no hands going up. That's a good answer, of course. I should have. It was a very leading question. Um, the, 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 the reason to show it doesn't belong to you is that it can be changed without your approval. Now, you'd be amazed in that.be, we have all the company information of all. The, some people mail us like, I want you to take my address of your websites. <laughs> your address doesn't belong to you. It's not yours. It's just metadata of an XY coordinate. But some people feel, yeah, go ahead. It's the fact that the address is linked to someone. But I'm not putting it somewhere. I'm putting your address on there. And the, and the location on there is a business. And so a business is not covered under privacy. You need to be a private person. Yeah, but of course, the case we get then is a doctor who has used, who is tax deducting his home. So he's putting the home as a maatschappelijke zetel, the, 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 the official business address, and then says, I want my home removed. And we say, it's a business address. It's also my home, but we're not saying it's your home. It has a VAT number of your professional tax structure that you, you, you set up to pay less taxes probably. Yeah, it's a corporate entity. We, we don't even know you're a doctor. It's a corporate entity. We might know because of other metadata, but the address as such doesn't give away you're a doctor. And so it shows how complex this is. Because the, the Flemish government in, uh, in 1st of January, they had a merger of some uh, cities. So the city of Overpelt and the city of Neerpelt, they became, can you figure it out? Yeah, you won. Get extra piece of pizza for you afterwards. So can you remember that one? <laughs> There's plenty of you for all of you. But so, Pelt. Now, I can guarantee you that both those little villages, they had a, a, a church street or a city street, the Dorpstraat or, or uh, the Dorpsplein. And so they had a problem. Because the uniqueness was determined by the, the, the city streets, or the, I, will, I will go for church street in Overpelt, church street in Neerpelt, and now they were both in Pelt and they both had a church street. So they had to change street names. And all the companies in there, the only one able to change your address is the company owner by publishing a bylaw. Just you can, of course, there were 300,000 impacted addresses, uh, units by this one change. So it's a little change to optimize uh, the city sizes and to have more uh, larger cities. It has a huge impact on thousands of structured databases. Because anybody who has ever ordered in any of those streets, they now live with what used to be an official address and is no longer, the veracity has gone down of that address. Because if you're going to try to deliver there again, it might come back. Because it does no longer exist. Of course, for a while it will be transformed. But so anybody in direct marketing who in 10 years' time wants to send a follow-up to that address, a sample, a questionnaire, paper, a direct mail, whatever, now needs to update. And by this little small example, I hope to show you how complex something mundane as an address can become when you're talking about big data. Because now you need to know, ah, in Flanders, six cities have changed their name. And as a result, 300,000 address entities need to be updated. And when you go to the businesses, from a legal perspective, the business has to update your address. And now the government has updated it for them. Yeah? So again, next time there is a conflict with the company, what is a good address? The address that the company published as their bylaws? Or the one that the government said, we have, we have changed your address, it moves there. Yeah. So anyway, small example, and then you have the address that was corrected by, by KBO, which might be a different one than the one that's being Amtshalve uh, is yeah. So, and, and really these are the little samples that show how complex it gets when you dive into, uh, into big data. And then you have value. Some fields are very valuable if you have a basket and what somebody bought and how they paid and how much and how often. And typically all transactional data are considered very valuable because it's easy to imagine the business models. But maybe the fact of knowing that parking space 72 is always empty is very valuable for somebody else. Because community things could move into the business of saying, hey, we know that every weekend for the last two years, there never was a park, car park there. So we're going to go around this building and offer it for rent to people. Yeah? And we're going to keep a cut of that or keep it all or make a deal with the, with the building to put this into a, a do-good cause. Like, hey, Tone, you're not using that park in the weekend. From now on, it will generate 30 euros per weekend because we're going to charge for the digitally for the use of your parking. And you can now choose three good causes and we keep 5% or 30% or whatever they determine to keep. Or we're going to pay you. Probably you get more people that are interested in that model. Yeah? And so something that starts as an IoT device 
can turn into something of, of revenues, and so it's, it becomes valuable. Yeah? Are you thinking about doing that? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, and, uh, maybe long, middle, term. middle term. So you see, there are, the, and of course, these are the things you do with that. You have that. You have, you have new business models to explore things to do. So yeah, that's really what I hope that I can, uh, by coming to these ten courses, that you will go home and really get like, wow! But in our business, we could use this and that and that element. And so we have a new business model. We have a new way to visualize it. We have an, uh, a, a little add-on we could develop and get this missing piece of information in a really cheap way. We can process the past and get insights for the future. We can optimize process. So that is what it's about. And so, business process. So, analytics, very classical one, I would say. Uh, anywhere you can you can look at it. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll maybe start from the variety again. So data creation is being generated. Any mobile app, you're leaking data all day long, more than you ever could have figured out. And you'll, be, you'll be surprised if you look at the InfoSec channels on what an average phone is leaking. Uh, I don't know who of you has ever looked at their, um, at their Google history. So, wow. You looked at it, wow, many, wow, that's great. I never had such a high response. And you, you really looked at it? You downloaded the set or you just went to, you, you downloaded your set? How big was it, just as a? Uh, I don't remember, uh, maybe hundreds of uh, megabytes. Okay, so it's not gigabytes, hundreds of megabytes, but that means you didn't put video or photos in there? That was just your, your data? Did you look at your location data? Uh, yes. And were you aware that you were giving this away to Google? I was aware, but uh, it was surprising anyway. Yeah. Did others of you have this reaction, like, wow? Yeah, so many people, when you see what you've been leaking for years, is very useful, but it's also very scary. You can see your, the address of your ex-boyfriend, girlfriend, lover, whatever, because that, for some period in time, you went there a lot. Yeah? Actually, Google knows a lot more, because your, your Bluetooth-activated device in your location, they can make this, but they know who was together five years ago and not anymore because they no longer cross at the same address. They know which schools you went to, they know where, which shops you went to buy to, just with your location. So I'm not doing nothing wrong, I have nothing to hide. Well, you can get a lot of information from your, from your history of where you went. Yeah? So that's just one example. Mobile apps leaking like hell. Geolocation, where were you? Your emails, extremely valuable. Yeah? I've had email for a while, they're all in the box. If you would analyze my history of emails, you could see who I was doing business with, with who I interacted a lot over the years. There's people from the year 2000s that are longer, no longer emailed, people I still email, the type of business, the type of language I use, the things I order, everything is in there. The receipts that are being sent, you'd, you'd really be surprised how much is in your, in your, uh, in your email and your messaging apps. IoT, machines and sensors, more than you can imagine. Yeah, we've just seen the parking one, we're not going to go for that one. But there's a, an insane amount of, of sensors all around us. Yeah, this building, is, uh, has, has, this room has sensors for the, the heating, the air. It's fully automated. There's a server somewhere collecting this data. It knows you could make a model that from the heat outside and in this room knows how many people are in this room. Because we each generate an, an, an amount of heat. And so you can say there were between 20 and 40 people in the room. And this is how long they stayed. Yeah? If, you have a, if, you, if you have to see how much air you need to put in there to keep the temperature at whatever is being set there. Yeah? And those are all the indirect ways, without putting a, a counter on the door how many people were in there, you can use indirect data. And that's really what big data is often about. It's finding those indirect data that you have at your disposal, being the amount of energy you had to put through, and you see that little regulator there, that's the amount of air that will get out here to keep the, the air, so if this heats up, this will just go open more. If I have a log file of this thing, and I have the outside temperature and the building temperature, I can perfectly well calculate why it, why it needed to be open all this evening to keep it to a certain things. And those, that's just very simple. Yeah? Something the building owners might not have even thought about when they installed it. And so there's an enormous amount of data that we now discover can be used for good, because I consider that a good use of data, to have less energy, to know which rooms are used, so you can then start to ex extrapolate, or you can do predictive, like, oh wow, we now know that for an average session of the big data course, we have uh, 25 people showing up, and there's one next week, so I can pre-cool the room, or foresee energy to do that, or already did afterwards. So th those are all the types of things you can do with, with, uh, with sensor data. 
log files. Who's using log files? Some people out there. So you're looking at what people did. Typical log file of a web server. What did people do on the web server? But uh, people who are in uh, telecom, the log files of a server or a switch. What went over it? Was it a video signal? Was it an audio signal? What, what, what type of information? What destinations did it go to? Yeah? Which carriers did, what were being used? How is this related to? So, and from these log files, if you're a carrier, it's being sold. Today, Proximus, you can buy, it's a paid API, they anonymized to a certain degree, but you can, you can buy where people are in a city. And because they are the biggest telco, you can say, oh wow, there was a really popular event. If there's the 1st of May or trams, you can see people coming together, but that's very sensitive data. Because if you take the data of all the phones that were at the Place Roup, for those who were in Brussels, that's where the 1st of May uh, of the, the, the trade union was being held, you can sort of guess that the people who were there were either very um, uh, touched and part of the, the, the cause of uh, uh, celebrating 1st of May. In the upcoming elections, they will probably vote on the left. It's unlikely they will vote on the right. If you now have the population of people who were there and you discount the cops that were around that might not stand, be on the vote left but that were there for security reasons, you have a perfect population to do political advertising. But you would not be probably be willing or, or supposing that this data set is being used for that purpose. But to a certain level, I can now buy this from Proximus. And in this example, don't tweet about it or, or because it's not a... It's, it's not one that I know that they sell that one, but as soon as you have a few hundred people, they sell it. So any concert organizer, any city, they can buy it. And not just Proximus, if you buy the one from Telenet, Proximus and all the operators, they each sell it, you have the perfect population. So if you want to know young people who go to Torhout uh, Werchter or to uh, Tomorrowland, it's only a few masts of GPS. They have all of them, they triangulate them even. You can know who's together, who traveled how, on which trains. You can ask, where did the population come from? And I want a 24 hour aggregated view and they will probably put it to three or four people. So this many from Antwerp, this many from Brussels, this many from Ostend. You can buy that. So you can, as an organizer of Tomorrowland, say, wow, we see that people on average came by train. So now we should go to the NMBS, SNCB, and ask for more trains. Because they typically drive in two hours before. And so that's data-driven information based from log files, not even from the concert organizer. It's data from a mobile network. The concert organizer didn't have to pay for that. We're all leaking this here. Just a beacon. And Proxybus knows who you are. They bill you. And they see your full history. So they have a profile on you. They will not sell where you, I cannot ask, give me his track and where did he come from, where, does he, uh, where can you expect him to go? But they know, they know your home address because that's where your phone goes to sleep or where it stops every night. Yeah? And so it, it is extremely valuable, these log files, and they're being used in the most uh, unexpected ways. Yeah? Any questions about that? Or uh, I can go up the stack, of course. I didn't go through that. So there's technology. Cloud Hadoop is one of the big data stacks we'll, we'll look at. Resilient networking is one of the things you, for data acquisition. So again, going back to his example, uh, it's a mesh, you're using a mesh network, right? Uh, not, not anymore, okay, but I'll, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna explain mesh, mesh network. So Sigfox, Loran, other ones you wanna mention? You looked at it in the past, no? Or? Yeah, so Loran, so there are, we are used to networks where you pay, for example, my phone, I pay Proximus every month, I get a certain amount of data, it goes to their network, it's proprietary, uh, they know what I do on it, but nobody else knows that. But you have mesh networks, which, are a mesh, which is organizing itself, so if his parking pot sends a, a signal out, the nearest one will, would repeat it, they're not using it anymore, but just for the visualization of it, and it would go to the first antenna with the highest signal that it captures, and that would propagate it to a destination that's in the packets. And so these packages hop on a mesh network, and if a node falls away, another one will take over until it reaches the antenna that puts it into a wider area network. And so these are extremely resilient networks because they no longer have a central point. Proximus has central routers where they check, aha, I get your subscriber number, I have your, your invoicing data, 
you can get this line opened because you have paid your invoice. And after 30 days of open invoice, there's a signal, I get your subscriber number, you want to call out, you're going to get a nice message, please call us, you have an open invoice. Yeah? But in mesh networks, the hop just goes on. And the protocol has built in all sorts of measures to avoid being flooded and how it goes on. So resilient networking. For those networks, they are operating in a free band zone. There is no operator to be paid for it. So uh, there's a few of them, but those are free networks. So in the IoT, they're used a lot because you don't have to pay a network operator. So you can sell whenever this network is available in a region, and like one antenna covers a commune, I would say, or even more for Brussels, the five antennas cover the whole of the Brussels region for that sort of a certain of them. So for a little cost, you can operate a network over a vast amount of time, and the network can't be killed because the more nodes you have in a network, the better it will work, actually. And pause on. Any comments on that? I know there's networking. Are you into networking or am I mistaken? No, not okay, sorry. Uh, from the usage logs, apart from the geolocation services, what Proximus is offering, we also have something like B Alert. B Alert, yeah. Yeah, in cooperation with the government, if something, if, if some calamity is happening at some location, yeah. so they immediately send text so, messages. So, very good use. Without knowing subscribers, the protocol of mobile allows to put a mask somewhere and say everybody who is on this mask gets this message. It's called Be Alert. You, each of you who has a Belgian mobile number, you can go to a website of Be Alert, you can register. And from then on, the government will send you a message if something, a real big calamity happens. Like close the windows because there's been a fire and there's, a, there's dangerous fumes coming, blowing over your commune. Or um, there's been a terror attack, stay inside till you get more news. Yeah? So that's another usage of big data, of course. But it's a blast. Yeah, it's a bl it's a very it's not individualized. They I don't think they even know who got the message. It's like everybody who's on the antenna gets this message, and so this is a revenue model for Proximus because they make a deal with the federal government and say we become your emergency messenger, pay us this many million per year, and we give you an interface to send this message. Yeah, last year there was an accident in the U.S where there was an um, incoming uh, uh, bomb alert. I don't know if you heard about the rockets. So in everybody living in a certain city got the emergency message of a Russian, I don't know if it was Russian, but it was like, seek shelter, incoming rockets. Yeah? The official message from the official authorities. It was a test message, but somebody deployed it on production. Yeah? Boom. Accident happened. One message being sent out with the wrong codes. Yeah? So that's another thing. We were talking about veracity. Can you trust this information? This was information coming from a government that's supposed to be true. And now we've learned people, it's not always true. Sometimes there's accidents. So you have to go and check on Twitter if lots of people are complaining about this message and say it must be a test because it can't be the way. Yeah? So again, interesting uh, case. Um, I'm going to skip for those other ones. Forecasting. R extremely valuable. Yeah? Uh, there can be seasonalities. There's a easy ones. If you sell ice cream, you probably do not have a big production batch in the month of October, November, because you're going to sell less ice cream in winter. You're probably going to start ramping up your production now, pre-summer, to make sure that when people want ice, they have fresh ice cream. Yeah? So that's very simple forecasting based on the weather. But this forecasting becomes more and more and more granular. We looked at energy consumption. The fact of knowing there's this much wind and sun coming, they have to fire up the energy central. So these systems now become all connected. So meteo information, weather information, is determining which energy is going to be produced where. And so there's people hedging kilowatts because they make models on what the weather will do to say, ooh, we're going to have a really cold month of May. So I'm going to buy kilowatts up front. I want to have a fixed price in Germany and nuclear energy from France and I'm going to pay you this much in May. And then if their model is right, they can sell that to those needing the energy and they take, they take the premium because the, the normal model of May would have been warmer. And so they make a profit. If their model is wrong, they bought really expensive kilowatts and nobody needs them, so they have to dump them. Yeah? And that's one, there's more and more models out there doing forecasting and this goes really, really far and that's... Uh, to give you one of the far, furthest examples I'm aware of, it's people using satellite images to determine the oil and gas reserves. You know those, oil, those big cylinders you see sometimes from the highway? They have a coupon on top and when there's gas in there, when there's a lot of gas, it's high up and when there's little gas, it's, it's down. 
And so based from the satellite images of the shadow in that circle, um, so they have, you need complex modeling for that. You need to know where on earth it is, where the sun was at that point in time when the picture was taken. You can see how much gas is in there. And so if you are a gas broker and you need to buy gas, you want to know the strategic reserves. Before, that was not available. Yeah, that was NATO classified even. This was secret information. Who has them, how much energy at their disposal and when they buy. Now, by using those publicly, commercially sold satellite systems, you can make a model to see, okay, and then you take all the ships, which are also in another database, which ships are going where with how much oil and gas. How now they arrive? In the port of Zeebrugge, we have uh, gas coming in from, uh, uh, from Algiers. And so we can see the gas central when the ship is there going up. And then for the next weeks, it goes slowly down till the next ships arrive. Yeah? And we can see ships from China coming. And so there are people who are trading in commodities who are using big data for for really advanced forecasting models to take positions about what they see coming in and out. Yeah. So this is like, this is not something I first said, you can all be a Google. Those models are not cheap to build. Yeah? But the value they extract from that are enormous. Yeah? And our governments are not using the same tools as big companies can use to hedge this and even bet against them. Like, oh wow, there's going to be energy sources in Belgium. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hoard all the available energy and then when it's really expensive, I'm going to sell it to them because I know they're going to hit a, hef a heavy winter according to my meteor model and I know there's no ships going there to bring fresh oil or gas and there's going to be a problem in Russia because everybody's going to need in Eastern Europe for turn on their heating. Yeah, for give you one theoretical example. Um, data exploration. There are tools, one of them is a data IQ, we'll come to them later. These are like Swiss Army knife toolboxes. When you go to big data and you go to big data discovery, you need to know what you're looking for. So you hire data scientists who clean the data and then look at correlations and use, and you have a business expert, or it can be, yeah, if it's medical data, you need doctors and biologists. If it's accounting data, you need accountants and financial experts. But these tools don't need all, they don't use all that. They just do a full discovery using all the available approaches of big data, artificial intelligence, of semantics, and so on. And they just go like, wow, I found this with that method, this with that. So this is exploring data. So that's the, in, making the inventaire and then figuring out, wow, that's really an insight we would never have thought about. Let's go and develop it. So that's the data exploration phase. You can contextualize data. Uh, one example of that is video. There is now algorithms. You give it a video feed, it will tell you what's in there. I now see a dog, I now see a person, I see two persons, I see a man and a woman, they're fighting, they're using, you have audio transcription coming with it, so you have, you know those subtitles on, 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 on uh, I would say, BitTorrent movies, they're often first run just through uh, audio, um, so voice to text, and then somebody will improve them. And, and those engines get better and better because the accents are now being recognized through the Alexas and the Googles of this world and the, what those algorithms have improved, they go back into other technology evolutions. <laughs> so we can talk to devices which have been improved by voice assistants that are used in a completely different use case. Real-time events, event management and stream processing, so that, that those are really hard ones. You need to build quite a lot of infrastructure to manage stream events. So. Um, if you want to have all the stock exchange data, all the Twitter feeds, all the, the Facebook posts, uh, all, all the, the things that change all the time, like um, any IoT network that is like exhausting a lot of data, it's streaming data. It's coming in all the time. That means if you have a hiccup of one hour, you now have a queue of two hours of data, the hour that you were late in processing and the hour that is still coming in. So your infrastructure needs to make a decision. Can I scale it up? and double my capacity to win back the hour? Or am I going to say, too bad, I lost one hour, I'm throwing away the queue or the archive, or if I didn't build a queue, I don't have it anyway, and I'm, I'm back online now, and I need to metadata, correct somewhere that I lost one hour of data. So I'm Proximus, I'm selling location data, I now have a network that went down and I didn't recover the last hour of data, what will I do? Yeah. Will I annotate it? Will I just not mention it? Will it? You will not know if you are the one buying the data to know who came to Tomorrowland. You will not know that there was no train for Aston, Austin because the, the, the local uh, collection point was disconnected for an hour. Yeah. If you annotate it, they can build a model 
and then it goes into the forecasting and the model scenario, like, oh, we probably had 20 people from Austin in there. And then the business processing, this is where all the magic and where everybody tries to, to point and so alert and respond, that was your example that you gave on B alerts. Just the fact of being able to know who's where, you can send alerts. So there's, in, in, in my business, which is text-based data, so it's really, it's really like text-based data, for example, you can set an alert. If you're interested in a certain company, we have, you put a VT number, and we alert you when there's a new publication. An email to say, hey, there's a new publication. This, this seems like a very stupid feature. It's the main feature attracting traffic to our website. It's people who came with a free account, they looked at the business page, forgot about it, and then three months later they get an update. Something happened at that company. I didn't even know I said an alert on that, but it's really useful because this was a, I was looking at this customer who was a prospect back then. Now they're a customer, and wow, they just went, they get a bankruptcy or a financial reform. I should immediately stop delivering them because I will never get paid. Or I should call out and say, hey, I see you're restructuring. What about my open invoice? Yeah? So that's a simple alert based on an event. The event being a publication. But you can also set alerts on a keyword. If you would set my name, and if I would appear in any publication in the Staatsblatt, you will get an alert. Ton van Acht is now appearing in this. You would have to look, what does it mean? But you get an alert. And so, you would probably not know if you set up uh, your company or if you set up a nonprofit that, you're, uh, that you as a keyword are being alerted to instances that are interested in you because they have a business relationship with you or they have an exposure. You have a credit loan at the bank. I can guarantee you that if you go bankrupt, the bank will know. Yeah? Because they buy this information on a, on, a, on a daily basis. And if it's a business, they will shut down accounts. And if it's a private person, they will make sure that they get their money and they start executing the mortgage uh, collaterals that they have on your house. Location-based services, we touched that. So, again, uh, this is one of my favorite slides. There's open data. So typically, any content you can freely reuse and redistribute for any use without attribution. So that's the pure definition of open data. It's any content that you can freely reuse for any purpose. Yeah? There's lots of government data, there's lots of private data being opened under the, what is called CC0, Creative Common Licenses. Zero means no attribution. Even. So that's um, it's a scheme. Then there's public data. This is a little bit more gray zone. It's on a website, it's on a social network, it's on a blog, a news feed, a product feed, an e-commerce and more. But it's not formalized. It doesn't say come and get me and reuse me for any purpose. But it's, on the other hand, it's public. So you have consent in the giving it away. I see the person in the back doing direct marketing and marketing and laughing because this is being massively used to enrich profiles without your consent. But hey, you made a LinkedIn profile. You put a profile picture on there. You're telling us where you want work. So next time you go to an e-commerce shop, they have enriched information. This is a professional working there. This is what they look like and so on. They use, they use the picture. I know of one big uh, e-commerce website. They use the Google images to know, oh, we need to deliver a flat screen television. Is this a home? Or is this a pita shop where somebody has a, with a stolen credit card also delivery will just pop up when the delivery is being announced, walk away with the flat screen television because they had fraud like that. Because then afterwards, if it turns out that the credit card was stolen, they don't even have an address where it was delivered. So these are anti-fraud measures that are being used, but it's public data, yeah? So they're using the images that is being sold, but you can discuss. Google has taken images of all the houses in Belgium. Not all those homeowners were informed up front. They can afterwards go there and blur their house, but it's the other way around, yeah? According to GDPR, if you process, you need consent up front. And so there's other laws that are saying, yeah, if it's in the public domain, so if it's from the street, I can, picture, I can take a picture of your house. The question is, can I process that and sell it? Google is selling this data through an API. So they're commercializing the public image of a house. And there's a whole question of what IP does the architect have? For example, Atomium, landmark. The architect's work has been protected very strongly. If you use the picture of Atomium on a, on a commercial website, there is a lawyer that will contact you to pay IP rights. Because the family of the architect is claiming the full IP rights on any representation of Atomium. So, again, this is, so I'm, I'm fighting for open panorama rights, so I think that any um, panorama should be open and freely used without consent. 
but that's a, that's a personal opinion. Uh, that's, it's referred to as panorama rights, that any landmark should be freely um, available to picture and to reuse for any purpose. Because it's a landmark. Yeah? And then, of course, the discussion is what are landmarks or not, but you can, you can have an easier discussion. About it. And then there's closed data. This is the data that's not supposed to be shared without your knowledge. And yet, I don't know who of you knows um, the website I've been pawned. Have you been pawned? Yeah? You, so half the audience knows it. To the ones who don't know it, like Anita, we will, we will add it to the slide or to the email that we send you tonight. Um, you can check your email address and you will find in which data breaches, all of them requiring your login and a password, your email has been uncovered. You can type your password. Please don't do it in the same session. <laughs> open a new browser and preferably on a different device and a different network, but you can test your password and they will tell you this password of which you thought I'm the only one that thought of my first pet's name with my mom's first name with my birth date and a secret number attached to it has been used on three websites. And wow, my email address was on those same three. The, the combination of my email and my password have been in data breaches you'd be really surprised how many of those are around. And so this is closed data. It's not supposed to be shared. And a lot of the value online comes from combining open data, we talked about the trained data, with your maybe closed data, which is your, your, your schedule of the day, and then a route planner telling you, wow, you should now leave if you want to make the train to get to the destination. Or your Uber is approaching, it's all automatically uh, set up in your, with your consent. Ten, hour, ten minutes before I need to leave, I want the Uber to arrive, so I arrive ten, hour, ten minutes early at my destination. Those are things that, services that are really easy to imagine that you could already program today. But that, the fact of your agenda is closed data. Okay? You're not sharing it openly unless if you are. And so there's more and more issues with closed data for anybody related to following up the, the Facebook uh, scandals. The Google scandals. So all the big silos are fighting to keep their data more private. And of course, there's this really, really weird dynamic now where they were able to build it all with implicit consent often. And now they are the forerunners of privacy. Here's consent. You can now decide what you share, what you want us to keep. But they, have, they are so big that for any, if I would want to build a Google, I can no longer make it because the, the rules have changed and the networking, network effects have played in their favor. And now they're going to sit on it and they, they make it harder for anybody else to have all the mapping data, to have all the, the emails, to have all the schedules, to have all the interactions, to have my full location history. All that together is extremely valuable. But you need to have the size of those silos and monoliths, that, uh, the GAFAs, to bank on it. So that's a, it's a personal concern of me, like how are we going to uh, fight to keep open street maps, which was an initiative that we backed from, uh, from, from the Open Knowledge Foundation, to have open maps. Because otherwise at some point you have to pay. Like in my website, that would be, we used the, the easy to use integrated map of an address. It was free, you went to Google, you, two lines of code, it was in there. 10,000 visitors a day, remember? So that's a lot of maps we were displaying. At some point, Google said, oh, this API, which was free for, I think, a decade or at least for a very long time, now you have to pay. And we forgot that somewhere down the line, in some Google service, we had entered a credit card. Bam, I was hit with a 2,500 euro invoice for the usage of an API that used to be free. And yes, I went to look, they have sent me an email to announce it. But that's, well, that's what can happen with free services. Yeah? It was never advertised as open. It was a free thing I got. And indirectly with my website, all the visitors of my website, I've been feeding the bees Google because they now know, they knew who came to my website and which addresses they looked at. Because it was a feed that puts together. They have the session of people logging on and which address they were being displaying through their API. And so indirectly, I was not aware of that. I was leaking information in them, which was valuable to them. And at some point, when they have killed off all the competitors, they could even make me pay to leak data to them. So this is an insane model now. Before, if something was free, you were the product, right? You knew about that cliche. Now you pay for it and you're still the product. Yeah? The Alexa is a great example. You pay to get it, knows your location, it tracks all your voice, and you're, you're helping them to get better. Anyway, open data, public data, make sure that you can use what you do there. Close data, your medical records, your bank records, and so on. And there's new legislation coming. Is there anybody who heard about PSD2? 
No, no, that's a nice. You heard about it? You didn't work in a bank, did you? No. It's a hobby of yours? Uh, no? Friend working. In friend working in a bank. So he knows about PZ2. Now you will all know. It's a Payment Service Directive 2. It's European legislation that will, it's already in effect, but it will be practically in effect in Belgium in September, which allows you as a consumer or a business person to give consent to what is called a TPP, a trusted per, a third party. And they can then take your bank data or initiate a payment on your behalf. Now that sounds very dull, right? Okay, so that sounds dull. But this is potentially changing the whole banking universe. Because if you no longer need to be a bank to initiate a payment, next time you go and get fuel, if you have own a car, today, the fuel cars, they bill you once a month. Now I can start a fuel car and say, you know what? what before you, when you go there, you put your fuel card or your RFID in there. I can check, because I got your consent, at the bank that you've given me, how much balance there is right now on your account. And if there's more than 100 euro, I will trust you in the next five minutes not to spend it on something else. I'm going to open the fuel. And after the five minutes, I will just, on your behalf, initiate the payment. And I don't need to be a bank or a payment institution because I'm using your consent to do that. And so this, this open banking initiative, PZ2 is powering that, allows it. But account aggregation, my company has built a tool for B2B where you can connect your three business accounts and then all your business accounts are in one interface. And I'm not a bank, but I can connect that. Inbound payments, oh, that must be your customers. Outbound payments, that must be your suppliers. So just based on those transactional data, you can imagine, or each of you, dozens of products that you could do with that. The whole question is, are you going to give this consent or not? You're already giving it implicitly to Google, to Facebook, by purchasing, by getting cons confirmation in your Gmail mailboxes, in your Hotmail mailboxes, whatever you're using. They can indirectly now do it. But as of September, they can become a trusted third party and they can say, hey, give me your payment history. So next time you apply for credit, the bank might discriminate and say, if you give me your full payment history, I'm going to give you a better rate. But as soon as you pull that, I th probably think that there's going to be half a percent extra because I no longer have a real-time view on how you're doing financially. Yeah? Just one simple example of how, where that could end up. Yeah? So as of September, expect banks and non-banks to propose to you to get consent to do stuff either with your, your um, what, the, what is called account aggregation, get access to your account, not to do any payments, but to aggregate the, the data from it. And the other service is, a, is a, um, payment initiation. It means that with your consent, they can now initiate payments. Very handy. Yeah? If you are a telco, you now need to have a, a mandate to do that. Maybe my telco, I can give a mandate and say, all payments of parking tickets and all those things from now on, just take it for my bill. And there's no more credit risk. You don't have to wait end of moon. It can be real time now. It's just an ordinary bank transfer. Go ahead. Actually, in the US, it's quite common. I don't know if it's going to be the same option in, um, in Belgium after September, but it's a horrible thing. You don't see the invoices. You just go and check and the bank statements look super horrible. You just have some digits that you really cannot read. Yeah. And especially if you check this once a month, it's a nightmare. You don't know the supplier. You don't know the... Um, the invoice nothing and you also go and you log into website all your details you just say uh, how do you want to pay uh, do you want to pay with your uh, bank account so you just go and do um, bank account routing number and so on and it's I would really advise you not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so this will kill a lot of innovation, right? But so the, the, the banks and a lot of fintechs are betting on the fact that this PND, PSD2 framework will bring so much value to you that you will give this consent. And the banks themselves, like KBC, Bellevue, they've already started offering the service that you can add other bank accounts to your bank. So in, in Bellevue, you can add the KBC account, and in KBC, you can add the Bellevue account which a few years ago was mind-boggling, right? You're logging into your bank and you see the other bank's statements in there, aggregated. From a consumer perspective, finally, I no longer need to log into two bank accounts. I get an aggregated view. Yeah? And if those views get enriched the proper way, not the bad way that you are experiencing in, in the US, that's because the US system is a very old school system. What they did is, you had two types of login. You had a login, one for view and one for transactions. Basically, that was a split. And for over 20 years already, people were used of giving their view to many instances. 
if you had your uh, taxes to do, uh, TurboTax, you could give it to TurboTax. It would take all your bank statements and it would say, ah, that's your salary. That's your gross salary. That's your rent or your, your mortgage. And they would automatically detect that from your, the view of your bank account. But that was not very granular. It was all or nothing. It would be the same. And so this PZ2 is opening the opportunity for you to be in, with full consent saying, for this purpose, that counterparty gets access to that information for that amount of time or until I pull my consent again. If you pull your consent, in certain cases, they have to remove everything they have or depending on the type of transactions you did. Yeah? So for anti-fraud, they can keep it, but they can no longer prospection on it. And it's the GDPR that will apply to what happens with those data. But so an example of very close data, right? Your, your financial transactions, you are aware that's worth a lot of money to a lot of people, if you can get that, because I can profile you. Where do you spend your money? How much do you earn? Which with seasonality, did you get windfalls that you have to spend unexpectedly? Did you go in the red? And so on. So very valuable data now being opened under a new legal framework, PZ2. So remember it, <laughs> it's a good acronym. Uh, but that also means that all of you who are in business, as of September, you have new payment options, you have new credit scoring options. You can imagine new products where the, the payment is happening in completely new ways that were not possible before. Yeah, so take that into account too. So I will, I will now quickly run you through, because it's a, maybe we should do a short break or we go straight to the pizza. What's, uh, you don't know how, how late did the pizza arrive? In half an hour. Do you want to have a break or we go straight to the pizza? Pizza? Straight to the pizza. Good, we go straight to the pizza. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ramp this up a little bit. So this was the uh, this was a 2012. You know those landscape things. You don't have to read on there. You will get it. But so somebody went to the effort of saying which technologies. In 2012, we had Hadoop, MapReduce, Mahout, Apache HBase, Cassandra. Those were like the underlying technology of a typical big data stack. So you can name those, see those. You had infrastructure as a service, Amazon Web Service, Windows Azure, InfoChips, Google BigQuery. Um, some of them are still around, some of them grown, some of them not. The, the Amazon Web Service turned out to be a very profitable business for Amazon. It started out as a, they were a web shop, they learned a lot about how to host big websites, and they made, they made it into a commodity for others. So something they learned by hosting the Amazon web shop, they compute infrastructure which was highly resilient, they put it into a cloud and they allowed others to build similar stuff on top of that. Everybody's like, well, how are you ever gonna make money on that? It's like a side business. It was like a few hundred million in the first years. Now it's a multi-billion dollar business. It's the highest, mar the highest margin business in Amazon right now. Yeah? So it's bringing literally billions of profits uh, a year, uh, this, this uh, infrastructure as a service. Then as others, now we, we it's not about all those logos. Go to the 2018 one. Bam. It means the buzzword big data has catch on. Hadoop is still in there, but you have so many data sources and API providers, so many open source tools, so many platforms, so many infrastructure things. So th this it has been it became like impossible. You need like a, a loop to go and understand which tool. So there is more tools than you can ever imagine. Yeah, so and more providers than you can. So this this shows if you hear the buzzwords. Those are all the providers, they're selling you the shuffles, you know, when you have a gold mine, there's a few people who make money because they hit the gold, but the ones that always make money is selling the shelves to the, the, the gold diggers. These are all the, the shelf sellers. Yeah? They're trying to sell you the tools to find that golden nugget that you, your business might be going for. So, huge, huge industry. So, if you look at those technologies, typically, there is a, there is a, uh, yeah, a, a few ways to go, to go through there. You have to store the data. When you store the data, there's basically two big classes. There's SQL databases. SQL stands for structured query length. So those are the structured ones. You have a database with tables, with a field. Like imagine a big uh, Excel file, it's structured. So Oracle is one of those. And then you have uh, graph databases. So Neo4g, for example, is a, it's a database that works with a graph. So you know those social graphs where you do a, 
or business graphs where you have a person and a location and uh, you can do attributes to it and you get these spire things, you know, those webs and then you can drill down in them and go through and see relations between, that's what's called a graph database. So this is a different way to store data and to visualize. You have uh, Redis, which is in memory, you have SAP uh, having their own system, there is uh, MySQL, so we're not going to go through all those now, but just to, 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 to make sure you, um, you know there's a lot of ways to store the data. So that's one thing. Then you have everything related to uh, extracting and converting the data. There's many more, there's just one logo on there, but it's a long line too. Then you have to transform the data. So for example, I have a date, but I have it in, written in three different formats. I'm now going to have my own date format, so I'm going to transform my data to something I can use. Then you have exploratory analysis. So I said we use Elasticsearch. There's many other ways to do that, high end and low end. Model build, generate insights. Typically, SAS and R, SPSS maybe for the academical people. Those are tools that they use a lot to model and generate classic insights. Yeah? Uh, visualization, again. And these tools, in the technical part, we will, we will touch upon certain stacks and build stuff with that, hands-on. Yeah? But so, no need to memorize these. Just know there are ways to store, to extract from that storage, to explore, and then you build models insights, you visualize them, and you execute it in production. Once you found out what your model is, so for example, predicting the gas need in Belgium, you have a model, now you're, you're piling it all together. My satellite images, my boats coming in, my uh, weather model, all very complex different things are being linked together to a model, visualized, boom, I can now have a production model that says me buy or sell. Yeah. I said that's a very complex use case to build, but it's, uh, it's possible. And there's this question about no SQL or SQL, that's the, the most technical I'll get to this. So SQL is a structured query language, is the way you ask something to a database. Yeah? So it is, it's a structured language, you say, I'm looking for this table, so let's put, call that the tab in your Excel, and I want to have the first row and everything that starts with an A, return me the result. Yeah, that's a, and that, that you do in a, in a structured way. Most of the current applications you see in web, mobile, enterprise, data marts, it's, really, it's structured, there's a relationship. I have a, an order form, I have a customer, I have a name in there, I have an address, I might have other people at that address, and so you structure this with a certain relationship, one to many, one to one, and so on. And so you have a relational relationship that uses joints. It's quite uh, intensive. If you want to say, give me all the orders from last year delivered at this address, because I now need to query all these different indexes of tables and get an end result together and then present it to you. And so the alternative to that was what was born as the NoSQL movement, where you have unstructured data, where you might not know upfront, and you typically have key value stores, which means you have an index being generated with one value and another one belonging to it, and when you query it, all the heavy lifting is done upfront, and you just get the result out at the moment you process. And so many of the big data tools underlying they have key value stores or document database or, or column family stores. So they really use a completely different way of structuring data. Yeah, and we'll get more into detail. This is the introductory evening, so we're not diving. But this is a very important one to understand. The difference about classic IT was all about doing a database model and a data lake and having different databases and connecting them all together. And the new way is to sort of mash it all up with NoSQL and a few a few uh, tax tags there. Um, turning big data into value, so we'll, we'll go through examples, but in financial, the whole thing of anti-money laundering fraud detection. It's, um, sometimes it's easy to understand, sometimes not. So I'll give you one example. I have a 19-year-old son. He got uh, threatened, had to give away his phone. He calls me and we had agreed at home that if you get under violence threatened and your phone gets stolen, we buy you a new phone because we don't want you to get beaten up over a stupid piece of electronics. Yeah. So he calls like blah, 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 went to the police. So I, I was in London at that moment of time. I was going to order him to ease the pain and the tears, order him a phone. So I ordered, he, he sends me the URL because of course the kids choose their own phone. I would like to have this replacement phone. The cheapest one was on a Dutch website. I was in London with a Belgian credit card. So I ordered that phone and in the last basket, things like ink, fraud, it didn't say fraud, it actually said transaction 
this disapproved called the help desk it was late in the evening nobody to be called so I was like why does it mean this is a, was a very large e-commerce website I was like oh wait let me take a proxy a proxy is a most of you probably know it but it's a technical way to which you don't the other side sees you from a certain IP address so I said a proxy from London to Belgium I logged into the same website over the proxy, a new basket, remove the cookies, a new window, and make the same order. I come to the end, put in my credit card, bam, the transaction goes through. Why? Because there was a fraud detection saying like, wow, it's highly unlikely that a Belgian in London is going to order a phone in a Dutch website to get delivered in Belgium. So all those things, we, that's fraud detection. And the other way, I have a technical capacity to overcome it. Because I understand, ah, it must be the, ah, yeah, of course, it must be the fraud detection. So this is a, looks like a dodgy transaction. Yeah. So you can use technological technological means to overcome the algorithm. And now this is a very basic, stupid algorithm. I think it was a very stupid way to limit your sales because I can't be the only one who does it. But it's an edge case, you know. It's an exception case. So in anti-fraud, all the exception cases we throw them out because it's costing more to have the stolen credit card with a London hacker being asked to deliver from a Dutch web website on a Belgian address we didn't prior know to this. So we're not going to serve the customer. Yeah? Anyway, financial data, a lot, of, a lot of fraud detection going on if you make payments. Sometimes it's really, really stupid. Her, um, a friend of mine was in Brussels in the Rue de Tehran. And uh, as you know, Tehran was in Iran, and uh, there was um, uh, uh, sanctions against Iran, and so the bank was not allowed. They had a huge fine. Uh, you can figure. You can look up which bank it was. They had a huge fine because the Americans said you've been dealing with Iran. There are no sanctions or not. So they put in anti-fraud. And as soon as you had Tehran, and there was like, whoa, stop the transaction. We cannot do that. Yeah. Just because the business address was Rue de Tehran. And so every single day, payments were late, refused, and they said, please, could you, could you move your business address? Why? Because it, this is our anti-fraud will not let it go through. So this is a stupid example of how anti-fraud gone wrong, being so basic. Yeah? There's a lot of basic anti-fraud going on, because the keyword was in there, and it was on the list of forbidden words. Yeah? If you want to get flagged in international databases, wire one euro to somebody with bomb in the in the in the in the statement yeah you get you might get questions those things are being kept for a long time those log files are being kept for a long time and they trigger uh, security services i was very amazed myself i was interviewed by the belgian secret services because in 2001 when the attacks in new york happened at a call center, they did outbound calls, and somebody had forgotten to make the right, so it was a mobile number, they did 0047 something, and they dropped a number, and they called to Iraq. On the day of 9-11, on the morning of. Two weeks later, two officers came in, like, yeah, we're uh, so please, we want to sit with you, we have the log files. Somebody from this office called to Iraq. It's like, no, we don't call, we don't do prospection in Iraq, it must be a mistake. No, I want to see who made the call. And so we had log files, and we're in the log files. And you saw the wrong number, and one call later was the right number. They could have figured that out, but no. They had gotten, this is 2001, lists of everybody who in that period made phone calls that had never called before. This was suspicious, and they went to manually check all the people that made those calls. Weeks later, again, log files, anti-fraud, you leave information, even the veracity was extremely low. And they could have done an algorithm knowing like, okay, if you call this number and then a corrected number, it, 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 you can discard it because we must have been the only ones doing that, yeah? But they went for every single element because it had such a high threat level or they wanted to please whatever service gave them that number to check who had called that number. So, retail, targeted ads with somebody in the back doing that, right? You typically look for the right segment, audience. Sorry? Yeah. Okay. And then we capture the like they don't share exactly like uh, the the cookie or the beef for GPR compliance, but we can say please to that server address this pool. Uh, we don't see uh, exactly. Of course, we don't. We never attach any kind of personal information to. A profile, yeah. uh, then we set it from the sector. But we can say we can aim to, to books and we have like basic information about where, uh, like 
social behavior and consume, uh, consume, like behavior consumed. But so you get aggregated data about the IP address of what they consume? A no, pool of no? Can, uh, the bad is, uh, we don't know uh, before when, uh, what the ads could be settled to whom. Okay. okay, we have a pool, yeah. and then when we sell the ads, we have the log of the, uh, of okay. of the ad itself. So from then, we have like uh, all the things that you said, like the fingerprinting from yeah. the so does everybody understand the fingerprinting of devices? You all know about this? Oh, no? So you think that you need to give your login and password and then uh, link it to a user account. But if you have any of these or these, the unique combination of the OS, the screen size, and the apps I installed on my phone probably already singles me out of all the phone holders of this brand. We run yeah? attribution model and cross-device attribution. Yeah, listen about this. This is uh, it's very weird to have someone in the room who will explain this is happening. So they do cross-device identification. Yeah? That means... We lose, we lose people across the device because cookies are not... Of, of not persistent. No. So, yeah. so we run... We have, we have run like a, uh, in a degree to figure out, okay, it's more likely that that person, that, like that, uh, that action on the log, I've yeah. seen people are sharing some uh, information about the key log, uh, the system, operating system, and so this is really a unique feedback from the room, because this is happening under the radar of almost all services you use. Yeah, so you think I'm an anonymous visitor, you go back tomorrow, they have a shadow profile of what you looked at today. Because your laptop had a certain screen resolution, certain plugins, a certain IP address, certain cookies, and even if you delete the cookies, these other things around it will still give away who you are. And this is many elements, especially the plugins and the font, even the fonts that are installed in, in your laptop. The combination of all those things can already point to you. And you need, there are really extremely precise. And so he's explaining that they buy a segment from Nielsen. So let's imagine people buying dog food. Yeah, you can buy that. And then this intermediate says, we're going to advert your dog food to that. So you have to trust them that you'll get a high conversion because you're not sending it to cat owners, but to dog owners. That's what you pay them for. So you get a certain click-through rates. But as soon as those people click through, all the data you have about them be go into profiling. And they will get to try to enrich and, and to cross-identify that you went on your laptop and your mobile. And so I'm aware of, um, I went to a trade fair last year in Germany. That was really funny. It's called DM Expo. Anybody went there in the room? You went there? So this is a fantastic trade firm because they're selling all your data and everybody is GDPR compliant. It's fantastic. So I went to a booth and the, there was a young guy on the booth, very enthusiastic with a tablet. He said, so yeah, can I show you what we do? German company, never heard about them. I said, yeah, type in my name. Yeah, I'll type in your name. What's your name? So type in my name. Ah, oh, yeah, we have you on file. Like, wow, German company, never heard about them. They have me on file. Yes, you're shopping at this DIY chain in Belgium. I said, yeah, indeed, I do. It's a DIY chain. I remember I'm a bit of a, a tinkerer. Um, yeah. Yes, and we also have your ghost profile. We're like, whoa, what do you mean your ghost profile? Yeah, because you have a, a point card. I'm very bad at those things. I lose them after the first time. Sometimes I ask them for a promo, but then I never buy with it. So they did something very, I think, smart for them, but shocking for me to see. Because when I got my point card where they could build up a profile for marketing, I paid with my payment card, which, as you know, has unique numbers linked to it. And so every follow-up payment I made in the shop with my stupid Mr. Cash card was linked to my ghost profile. I didn't use my points. If I would log into the card, I wouldn't see the purchases, but the shop would still know it was me. And then they did something else that I was really, really... They, he said, yeah, we send you file, we send you promos when you enter the shop. I was like, wow, how do you even... Yeah, because people check on their... They, if they're in the shop, they get beep, beep, email, you get it out, and you're like, oh, wow, that's handy. I'm in the shop, and now I get a promo. And they know what I've bought through my profile, so they give me the promo for the right stuff, so I'm going to buy more, or the, the promo that they want out anyway. I said, how can you know? I mean, ah, that's very simple. You've been X number of times. You have all the Bluetooth devices, and all the Wi-Fi devices, everything trying to connect to the free Wi-Fi in the shop. 
So we cross the people at the till, which, and it is enough three visits to know exactly who you are. And so from that on, you go into this chain, they have your Bluetooth, and they link it to the transactional email sending the promo, because they have very high open rates when you're in the shop if you get a, a promo from that shop. Yeah. And that's to show you, this is about big data, huh? this, is, this is retail. I never, I'm pretty sure I never consented to that. Yeah? But, and I didn't even know the company, and they had my full history of me going in the shops. They knew who was queuing before and after me, yeah, because you had the queuing history. So they, they did stuff that I was like, but why would you even want to keep that? Ah, it's, sometimes it's useful for us to know that you always shop like a handyman that brings the customers along, and he makes the customers pay. But for them, it's very valuable to know that the handyman was there. They get into his phone, so. They build profiles of handyman that buy more than any person can buy, but they know that the, 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 the promos going to the handyman it has to be different. Because he comes in with customers, and one time it's a bathroom, another time it's a kitchen, and it's a garden house. So it's a crazy profile if you look at this person that was at the till not buying anything. But they did have his on file through the mobile. Yeah? It's because that this uh, UI uh, chain has clients, right? It's, it's, it's the only reason that this information or did they find it someplace else? Did they have them as clients? Yeah, so, the, so I was, a, so I can, so the, 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 the talk started nice and I was really impressed and the guy was really enthusiastic explaining how they did it. Yeah, we have Bluetooth beacons and we have, we connected the Wi-Fi network and we do the transactional emails and it's all marketing automation and we build the profiles for it. So I was like, wow, this guy, they know their shit and they have a nice platform for the retail chain. Then his boss came. I was like, what are you doing? I'm showing this gentleman from Belgium that we have all this data. He was like, you're not allowed to log into the customer platform. I told you so. That's only for internal demos and training for the customer. That's not to show the trade fair. Sorry, sir. Can I have your car, please? I will apologize. I have to, I have to report a data breach. Blah, blah, blah. I don't think they did that. But <laughs> So I saw the insights or the underbelly of what one chain knew about me. And you just confirm at your company, you use similar techniques. You try to identify customers. But this is really... This is not a gray zone, eh? this is just from a GDPR perspective, this is just illegal. Because as a consumer, none of you would have consented to that. But from a big data perspective and a marketing perspective, it's gold, right? And so this, sorry? Sniffing is not illegal in Europe. Sniffing is not illegal in? Europe. In Europe, okay. So the sniffing he's referring to, so it's not about your perfume in this room, don't worry about that. The sniffing he's referring to is like, you put a Bluetooth and a Wi-Fi uh, sniffer, and everybody who walks in here gets tracked by it. And by the location of where you put it, that sniffer would now know that we are here all together. Apparently not illegal. I would say that when you cross that with other data and process it, it would become illegal, because I have not consented to that usage of my data. Yeah, but so that's uh, that's the legal uh, opinion that I would have on that. But uh, the the action of the sniffing is not illegal, and so it's being used because it's not illegal. Yeah, and so the. Do you then need to be hooked to the, the Wi-Fi? No, that's the that's the amazing part of it. The fact that your phone is just trying to connect to it, giving away you the name you give to your phone, and the operating system, the unique codes that your 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 MAC address or whatever it is that is being sent along with the request. That is being stored there. You don't even need to connect on it. The fact that your Wi-Fi and your Bluetooth are on are two fantastic channels. The third one, the, the, the GSM channel, is being captured by microcells in shops. So it's no longer the antenna you see on the parking lot. It's in the shop. They can know through these micro uh, antennas where you are in shop. Even the, when you put all that out, you can still do triangulation of where somebody is with just a mobile signal. But it's more precise with the Bluetooth one. So many shops know you get in. Because you pay at the till with your frequent flyer points or your uh, Carrefour card or whatever it is. They know you were in there because they already tracked you with the same technique I just explained with the DIY chain. Three visits and they know which ones were at the till. So you must have been that one because the, the only mobile fingerprint I have that is unique on those three purchases was you making the payment. So it must have been you. So it's very simple deduction. Yeah? And so the next time you walk in, they now know in which lane you are. Because they do targeting and they cannot track your profile to see, oh, you spend a lot of time in the vegan or in the, the, uh, the bio, the, the, the bio um, uh, department. We're going to, from now on, we will spend you more specific. If they would not track that through your purchases, we can specify the message on that. All 
whole retail chains in Belgium have very elaborate profiles on all their customers with these frequent flyer, uh, with these, uh, with these uh, loyalty programs. If you get a Colred folder at home, it's yours. In the old days, there were like 60 different types, segments. You would be segmented into it. But uh, my wife is vegetarian. We eat hardly any meat at home. I never get meat in my uh, Colred folder because they know we never buy meat. Yeah? So it would be a stupid waste of paper to sell me a meat promo because it will never sell. And they know this. They sell all the eco bio uh, products because that's the products we buy them. Yeah? And so that's what profiling is about. You were, you were thinking like, no, there's not I more. I think that's only color rate. He's doing that very well. Profiling and making personalized yeah. ads and viable data print for the folder. That's the others are not so. We're not so. So they were definitely very early. Colorado is a historic leader in this market. Um, actually, around the corner, you have one of the first Colorads, the one on the, right behind the building. Uh, they had Ponskaarten already in the 70s, which are like these data punch cards. You, you product, so they already had computers in the shop to do stock and inventory. And they were among the first ones to do good profiling. They actually used the SAS software for that. So it was one of the tools you saw in there. It's a, one of the closed source tools. But see, they profile with that. And they have a lot of profiles on you. And so maybe let's, let's go through those because we, we have those pizzas or we hope to have those pizzas soon. So how to start smart? Review your data. What do you have? And so I said this is the beginning of the course. For the next nine sessions, we will touch deeper on many of the elements we've just like, given you in this big blast tonight. I know it's a lot of information that went your way. But so what do you have? How is it used? Are you allowed to use it? Yeah? Do you have expertise to manage your data or not? Many companies have a lot of data they didn't have. So those Bluetooth sniffers and Wi-Fi sniffers. Many companies have a Wi-Fi hotspot, but they never even use the logs, they even know they had logs in that machine. Yeah? But that, that, that Wi-Fi hotspot has a log in it. And if you bought it recently, it probably went to the Cisco cloud or wherever. You can go and pull everything back without knowing that you collected this. It's still in there. If you're privacy aware from now on when you shop, you will probably disable either go in airplane mode or disable your Bluetooth and Wi-Fi so at least only the telco knows where you are. Yeah? That's the other result of following this course is that you probably become more aware of how many data elements you're leaking that are being used before or against you. The companies we collect and will say is to raise your user experience. The privacy aware in the room will say is to price discriminate and to resell me and I didn't consent to it, so please remove it. Yeah. Other wise questions. Yeah. How is it used? Are you, are you being specific enough when you ask consent, for example? Can you, in the GDPR, it's very important that you specify the users of your website or service what you're gonna do with which data element, what they can expect it to be used for, for what term you store it, how they can pull it out, and so on. And then make your own conclusions, of course. Huh? Did, you, did you do a sense check on the data that you have? Uh, are you collecting with a certain hypothesis? Is it important for you to know if you have men or women as customers, as prospects? Yeah, then you should not ask it and not store it if it's not important to the type of product you sell. Yeah? Uh, what else do you need? So the challenges are scalability. Like we gave examples. If you start taking real-time data, it explodes. To take the example of the sniffing that's not illegal in Belgium, that you uh, seem aware of, if you do that on all the, the, the points of sales of your customer, that's a lot, of, a lot of data you're collecting. Will you collect it every second, every minute, every 15 minutes? That you, depending on how much data you want to store, the scalability of your infrastructure, the needs will be very different. So you need to determine, what am I going to need? What is the data quality? How will I secure it? Like, is this open data? Is this closed data? Am I the only one who should see this? Do I want to share this and expose this to my customers? Should they be able to pull the reports themselves? Should they be able to pull all the reports itself? Which elements were exposed? The cost management to generate actionable, actionable insights and do we have the talent to manage all that? Many today, I think that's one of the reasons you're here, there's a huge shortage in people who understand big data and who understand how to pull value from them. And, and, and 
if you go further in this field, you can rest assured that you will not be in a shortage of interesting job opportunities for the time to come. Because this is really a field where we, 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 we lack a lot of people that understand what you could do. And so it's no longer, please look for this religion. It's like, hey, I came up with this idea. With that, what we have in the open data, we could now provide this service or monetize other things. Now, I will, until the piece has arrived, I will just do some practical examples. I'm just going to look if uh, Candida is still around here. Candida, have the pizzas already arrived? Ooh, then, then we're going to rush through this very quickly now. That's right. Data for goods. A large hydrogen collider. Yeah, this spitting the smallest possible uh, entities to, to a wall, get the data out of it, and then analyze from what you find where the explosion happened in the, in the uh, LGC. What happened? That's data for goods. Yeah. Then you have fake data. Volkswagen Group, Audi. Exhaust pipe. We make a program built by Bosch. We put in all the cars and the cars will now auto-detect. This was Internet of Things and sensors that will detect am I being tested or not. When I'm being tested, add this product to the diesel so my exhaust goes down. If I'm on the road, don't bother using this product because our customers will not go to fill it all the time. We just let you drive with full exhaust. That was something put into millions of cars. Somebody using sensors and software for what we now consider a very bad use to try to jump a hoop on legal standards. And all the regulators in the world looking the other way or not wanting to go too deep into to, to recertifying that. Yeah? Um, I'm, I'm going to skip these, but all these sites have been leaking data. The most uh, probably sensitive one for the ladies in the room, if you ever did ovulation cycles, in an app to see like okay natural birth control or, or um, uh, not wanting to get pregnant wanting to get pregnant whatever it is there was a real-time api on those apps going to facebook can you imagine like the this was not advertised in those apps yeah? but based on your temperature based on other data that you feed into the app your your cycle this was being fed into facebook it's linked to your mood it's linked to whatever so this is that was definitely supposed to be private, that was exploited, and, and openly, this is not a made-up story, this is documented. So this was one of those uh, ovulation cycle sites sending an API. There's, there's incredible things that have been leaked to and from Facebook, but I let you uh, go there. There were app events that, that were like, if you used activity trackers, that was all shared. There's a famous example, and I want to... It's a very dangerous one because it's the most used, not fully documented, and probably um, it has some truth to it, but it's already being exposed as not going that deep. But this was a story that struck a chord, and, and as, a, um, as a storytelling <laughs> works very well, a father got really shocked because his underage daughter got a folder, not from Colorado, but from one of the others, uh, from Target to be precise, with baby baby stuff, young mom and baby stuff. And he were like, listen, they're uh, targets. I hereby complain, because what do you think that you are? You're sending, uh, uh, you're trying to get my daughter pregnant or what? And she's a, uh, a young woman and she's a and then it turned out that she was pregnant. And so at some conference, the data scientists of Target gave this as an example of things that they could predict. They could predict on what people looked at and bought that you were going to get pregnant. The, I had somebody from a Belgian chain telling me that on average they have to sell 2.5 uh, predictor sticks before the pregnancy kicks in. So the, the retail, if you buy it at the retail service, this is being tracked. If you buy that with your ghost card or your train, the retail chain now knows that you are buying predictor sticks. Yeah? You don't buy those for no reason. Yeah? So, you can do prediction models yeah, on those. Yeah? And so you're leaking data for unexpected. But so anyway, this story is short. Then he had to write a letter. So apologies, my daughter has just admitted she, she's pregnant. How did you know? And then the data was like, oh, well, our predictive model had knew about that. So we were already sending the folder. So this is not, a, it's a Stadsverhaal, as they say in Dutch. It's, it was said by somebody one line in a conference and it was then exploded by a journalist and that article went viral. It has been debunked in the meantime. But it's a good story. We all like to believe like, wow, they're that smart. It's probably the models were not that good, uh, certainly not at that point. This is one I love. Strava, Runkeeper, anybody uses those? Yeah, a few people in the room, it means you do sports, you run uh, or do another sport. So you buy the device again, you buy it. 
you can get for free. You get users from it because they make like, oh, today you've been running 10 kilometers. This is your third fastest run. Or you can make groups with friends. And wow, you're, on, you're running more than your two friends. So we can send, as they call, social nudges. Like, your friend is running this week. You haven't run. So working on the psych, uh, psychology that you should run too. So they sold literally millions of those devices. And people installed the app. And so the device went to their phone. And they store everything in the phone. And the phone uploads it to the cloud or the, phone, or the device directly, the tracker to the watch or the heart, the meter, or whatever they used. You have a few of those platforms. And then it turned out, they were like, oh, we could do a global heat map. So the central platform, who has aggregated all the runs in the world, was like, oh, it's great. We can compare uh, US East Coast, West Coast with Europe, and how many people run, and how far on average. And oh, wow, we could do a map of the best ways to run in that region, because that's where most people take their Sunday run. Yeah? And then it turned out that they exposed this. Because people in the US military, they had those devices. And when you're a soldier, apparently, you train a lot. And if you're in Afghanistan, you train in the compound of your secret mission. And so now Strava, a private company who had no contract with the military, had perfect maps of where you could run in the military compounds in Afghanistan, in some, in some location that was nowhere exposed, in the middle of the desert, hidden from satellite images, blurred because it was a military uh, region. And so this is like unintended leakage of data through a commercial player because a soldier, they like to go running. They never ask approval to the army. Can I wear my fitness tracker when I'm in Afghanistan? You're like, oh, it's a private fitness tracker. Who cares? It was all uploaded to the cloud of Strava and RunKeeper and all those. Exposed. Famous example. Um, I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm, the Tesla one, you've been reading the stories. Let's skip that one. Uh, Waze, very, very interesting one because it's using all the nodes in the network to predict models of traffic. So the, I should probably, we're at the end of the day here. Right? You're going to get some uh, shiny screens if I walk onto the cable. Um, they use all the data submitted voluntarily by users in return and they give you nudges like, hey, if you, repair, if you report a car or a police car on the side of the roads, thank you very much. And this many drivers have thanks. So they use a combination of IoT, your device, combined with what the interaction you give from the car, which is crazy because you should focus on the traffic and they want you to push like, oh, there's a dangerous situation here. And they give you a social nudge. Wow, thank you. Five drivers have thank you for putting that car accident in there. So, but very interesting model. I heard about a data scientist who, who pretended to me, I haven't seen it work, that he had devices using like proxy, but then they use a layer in between with a fake location. And so if he was somewhere and wanted no traffic, he would pretend the streets ahead of him to have a lot of traffic in them. So Waze would send everybody in different ways. Mm -hmm. And then he would drive when there was no traffic. Yeah. I'm, I have to see that work. Because <laughs> if he drives through it, he has a magic, a magic car that flies over them. But it, it, it's appealing to think, yeah, now you can scam the algorithm. Because if you have 20 devices, which would be the model of 100 cars, because only one in five cars would, for example, have the, the, this one. If you can send a fake location to it that moves very slowly, it's going to say, these streets are blocked, and then they send traffic elsewhere. Um, going to skip that one, too. Um, this is a, I'll, we'll share the video for you, but uh, acoustic sensors. You only need a few. In the US, huge, I, I understand you came from there. Huge gun violence issues. Yeah, uh, that's in certain cities. I don't know which ones you lived in, but in many cities they have uh, people shooting guns. It's a, it's a, there's algorithms using the audio. So on the street poles, they just put a listener. So this is pre-cameras. And it detects the difference between somebody slamming a door of a car and somebody shooting a gun. And so when it detects guns, police alerted. We have just detected three gunshots in that area. So using IoT sensors, but it can be used for many more things. All the electricity lightning now almost has IoT in it, even Bluetooth sniffers, as you refer to. It can detect how many people are working in the street. It can light the street when there's people going through and shut it down when there's nobody. You have less light or one in three when there's nobody in the street. So we go more and more to interactive cities and, and, and city infrastructure, which is being turned on and off depending on the usage of the people that are expected to pass through or that are passing through. You've seen probably a few of these fully artificial uh, images, synthetic images built from real images. Yeah, there's GAN networks, uh, gender, uh, gender um, adversarial networks that allow you to build stuff, and you can now 
even give weights to that and say I want more nose, I want more, uh, the mount needs to be more open, and it has been modeled. And so there are now databases full of fake synthetic images of people that, that, no, that no, do not exist, and we as humans can no longer tell them apart. We think that's a human image, somebody that doesn't exist. So more and more will be fixed. And the last one, I'll go very quickly for this one, um, is the right to repair movement. So John Deere, one of the biggest, uh, so this is farming. We think low tech, no, it's actually a really high tech industry. And a farmer buying a truck is buying a big data center on wheels nowadays. Those trucks, they can drive themselves with very precise uh, GPS. They know how much traction you need to put, they know what's in the road, they know when they pass, where, how, you can fully program it. And so, when they break down, it's a computer, you have to go to the repair center. And as it turns out, we as consumers now buy products with the price, either with discrimination or not, and Tesla had an example of that. People bought Tesla cars with a smaller battery. And then you had, a, um, I think it was a storm or a, a tornado coming in, and I said, oh, good news. Everybody with, the, and I don't take me on the kilowatts, everybody with a 60 kilowatt battery now gets a 75 kilowatt battery for 24 hours to run away from the, the, the zone. What? I bought a cheaper car with 60 kilowatts, which was supposed to be a smaller battery, and now software over the air update of my car gives me the extra kilometers to drive far away from the tornado zone. Why? Because they produced only big batteries and the software would limit them. Yeah? So it was cheaper only to have big batteries. And this happens more and more. You buy products, so these trucks now, they ha you can buy updates of power, of battery, of extras, but you need to pay for them. And so there is there is uh, farmers who have a very special uh, idea about this, who fight for the right to repair. I buy a truck, whatever is in there, I have the right to repair it. Also meaning I can overclock as you would do in a computer, I can get the full battery, I can get more power if I can tinker with it. And so there's been lots of trials in the US about the right to repair. Because the company likes to say, if you tinker around with the software, you all warranties void. And so current case law says no, as the owner, you own it, you can tinker around it. You cannot complain it doesn't work anymore, but you're allowed to, to, uh, to, to fool around with it. So with that one, we're going to end the first session. <laughs> we're going to have pizza, so I don't know if the pizza is going to be served here or in the room. We're going to serve here, we're going to serve here, and we'll do the Q&A with the pizza. Is that a good idea? Yeah. yeah, good idea. So if you help me set a table or help Candida set a table here, or are we going to do it? Okay, one, one last uh, technicality. We have Big Data BXL, which is our hashtag. So we would be really grateful in the next few sessions or even tonight if you take a picture or liked it or do a post to use the hashtag. Because, of course, these are the things we like to have more people for the second sessions and the hackathon, so you would help us to get propagated. If you have colleagues or friends and you say, wow, this was an interesting evening, I learned something, invite them along for the next sessions. We will give a 10% a, a discount on top because they missed the first session. But we, as you can see, we still have capacity and we like it to, to be filled. So don't hesitate if you found it. If you can't make it one of the next sessions, we have the video of filming. You're turning it off now? No. No, it's still turning. <laughs> we didn't get your consent to film who's eating which pizza. Yeah, we need a sniffer for that one, right? <laughs> You're cutting it? Yeah. Right, so now we're private. The cloud will not know.